Okay, well, I've got uh, 1034. Oops. Why don't we get started? So, no. so good morning and wel welcome to our annual Chicago Milwaukee Joint Chapter meeting. Uh, we haven't done this with Zoom before. We usually meet at the Brat Stop in Kenosha, Wisconsin, in between the two places, and it turns into a good day of talking baseball and uh, uh, getting to meet a lot of Saber members we normally don't see. Uh, I'm Dennis Dagenhart. I'm with the Ken Keltner chapter, uh, Badger State chapter. Co-hosting is uh, Jason Swartz and Bill Perch, um, and they're with the Emil Roth chapter in Chicago. Um, you know, when we started putting this together, we came up with two very topical ideas pretty quickly, and and we're really happy we were able to get these two topics going. Uh, and with so much happening in the last couple of days, it really worked out well. Thank you, Mark, for Sabre bringing out their recommendations for uh, the Negro Leagues. And then of course, Major League Baseball, having seen that we're having this meeting today, was nervous about not having it finalized before Sabre met. So they, they rushed that through for us, I'm sure. Uh, the minor leagues would have probably appreciated us if we had taken the step earlier, maybe two months ago, and maybe they would have wrapped this thing up quicker. So our apology to Major League Baseball for our, our delaying this. Um, but uh, leading off today, uh, we're going to have a topic that I named Good, Bad, and Bad of the Minor League Reorganization, and that'll be with uh, Sabres uh, CEO, Scott Bush, who signed on and he's got his name on there now. He's not the first, the second Jason Schwartz. For those who came in late, we'll explain it later. Um, uh, and he'll dis discuss, discuss the ramifications of the Major League Baseball sweeping changes to the minor league structure to be implemented this year. And, in, and he'll also talk a little, I'm going to talk a little about uh, our major league clubs in Chicago and Milwaukee, any changes for us on that as well. Cool. And then after, and then after Scott, uh, we have uh, Bill and Jason moderating perspectives on a major league baseball Negro Leagues announcement with a star studded panel um, featuring Sean Gibson, the executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation, Larry Lester and Scott Simkus, Negro League researchers and Mark Armour, our uh, uh, Sabre board president. And they'll discuss the Major League Baseball's announcements regarding reorganization, recognition of the Negro Leagues as a Major League, the statistical ramifications, that'll be interesting, and the campaign to rename the MVP award for Josh Gibson. A uh, couple of housekeeping rules uh, real quick. If you could mute your mic, that we'd appreciate that. That will help with controlling the background sounds. Also feel free to use the chat and to ask your questions, we'll monitor that as we go along. Uh, the other item I usually do with housekeeping when we're in Kenosha, I have to point out where the bathrooms are. I hope most of you will not need that help today. So, um, so are there any questions before we get started? Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Scott Bush. I, I have the, uh, the pleasure of working with Scott on a monthly basis. Um, I'm a, a member of the Friends of Sabre and uh, it's, it's uh, you, Scott, I have to thank you in COVID with the challenges that all organizations are facing. Your leadership has really, I think, helped turn Sabre around. So thank you very much for that. Um, little bio on Scott before joining Sabre in 2018. Uh, uh, he served as a senior vice president for business development with the Gold Clang Group. Um, he, he demonstrated a commitment to creativity and his established track record of generating revenue, cultivating new markets, and collaborating with a wide range of stakeholders make Bush an ideal fit for the next stage of Sabre's evolution within the baseball ecosystem. And I agree. Since graduating from the University of Minnesota, Bush held positions with increasing responsibility in both sports and media, including a five-year stint as assistant general manager for the St. Paul Saints, uh, who have some interesting news for their fans, uh, where he played a key role in establishing CHS Field in St. Paul. Uh, before we start, can I ask you uh, kind of an icebreaker, Scott? Please. Um, and I think I know this, but I think you told, you mentioned this on the, I always do the Rob Nyers questions. Um, wh what was your earliest baseball memory? Uh, my earliest baseball memory was uh, the, sort of the, the 
87 World Series. Uh, I was was very young uh, when the Twins won the World Series for the first time. And uh, I, I mostly just remember uh, how people were amazed that they won. Uh, and history with that team, if you go back and look, it is astounding, actually, uh, that a team that average uh, was able to win the World Series, but they did. Uh, so, yeah, my, my earliest baseball memory was the 87 Twins. And, I, you know, Minnesota – Minnesota born and raised, went to the University of Minnesota. So I, I always call this the Ken Keltner chapter, not the Badger chapter, uh, personally. I, I'm opposed uh, to anything Badger. <laughs> but are we all set? Can we see the screen here, Dennis? Yes, we are all set. So please proceed. This should be interesting. Thank you again. All right. Well, thanks uh, thanks for having me. This is a, this is a topic that is incredibly near and dear to uh, to my heart. Uh, I spent most of my career, as Dennis talked about, in the, in the minor leagues prior to uh, prior to coming on board with Sabre um, and had the, had the good fortune really to sort of see all aspects of how minor league baseball works. I've, I've worked, um, I've worked with teams at all levels in the minor league hierarchy uh, with the exception of double A. So I've been part of a triple A club been part of both levels of a ball been part of a short season team been part of an indie ball team for um, a lot of my career and and uh, and been part of a collegiate wood bat team and, and all of those operations and many others uh, are affected by the changes that were just announced yesterday um, before we before we get into all of this i actually want to begin with a little bit of trivia um, and since everyone's at home and in front of a computer, I'm going to ask that you stick to the honor system pretty strictly here. Uh, but the, the trivia, which we'll get to the answer a little bit later in the presentation, is this. What team drafted and signed, uh, the last part is pretty important, Mike Lansing to his first professional contract? Um, the answer may surprise you, and it also connects pretty importantly to a lot of the uh, a lot of the topics that are going to come up in this discussion. So, Miami Miracle, Stu, you know we weren't looking for an answer just yet. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't look it up though. I didn't look it up. Really, <laughs> on our system. Sorry, I didn't we're, know. We're going to have the Stu Thornley Trivia Bomb Award, I think. Okay, uh, yeah, the Memorial <laughs> Stu Thornley Memorial. Okay. <laughs> And I like your green belt sign there too, even though you. So, <laughs> I do have the green belt sign over my shoulder. We'll get we'll get to why that's relevant uh, as we as we get later on into this. So, um, you know, I think I think a little bit of how we how we answer the question of what has happened. It's important to, much like David Byrne, acknowledge how did we get here, um, and. Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball and its predecessors really have operated as distinct separate entities since 1903. Um, when the National Association acknowledged that the American League and the National League were signing all of the best players. And in fact, the National Association was not going to be capable of keeping up. So at that time, uh, when they declared detente, uh, there was an agreement that governed, governed the recognition of contracts and player movements. So at that time, uh, you started to see things like uh, the Rule 5 draft get created. Um, as this structure moved on, uh, teams started to formalize relationships with minor league clubs on their own. Uh, and that accelerated even further with, um, with entrepreneurial owners and general managers like Branch Rickey, who wanted to really invest in a minor league structure for the purpose of player development. So rather than uh, sitting around waiting for the opportunity to sign players from minor league teams, uh, major league clubs began creating their own structure so that they had the ability uh, to have those players already. So as that advanced, uh, the independence of minor league teams 
continued to dwindle and, and, and the golden age of the 40s and 50s of minor league baseball really began to suffer uh, into the 60s. And in particular, television played a role in that, in, uh, in that dwindling. Uh, you started to see smaller towns uh, that really relied on the ability to consistently draw a lot, a high percentage, a high per capita of their population, uh, their attendance started to suffer because families were no longer leaving the home. Uh, they were they were actually staying at home uh, for entertainment, and they were also uh, getting the chance to watch baseball on television uh, for the first time. So we started to see a reduction in the number of clubs enter territory rights. And this is an interesting aspect of the major league and minor league baseball relationship because at today in modern baseball, we view territory rights as arguments that big league clubs have uh, with, with no greater example than uh, the long drawn out argument between the Orioles and the Nationals about uh, millions of dollars in television rights. But this was actually initially created primarily uh, for the benefit of minor league clubs. Uh, and in essence, it allowed the major league clubs to pay off the minor league teams to allow their games to be broadcast in a minor league market. Uh, that is an interesting thing because in a, um, in a crime family, it would actually work in reverse. The little guy would pay the big guy for protection. And in this case, we actually were seeing the big guy pay the small guy for the same. And out of this mutual benefit, there became a bit more of a partnership model, uh, which then adopted uh, PDCs or player development contracts. And player development contracts uh, have then remained uh, until today. Um, and so that was, that was one of the last major sweeping changes between Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball until 1990, uh, when the PBA, which is the Professional Baseball Agreement, which is the, the broader contract that Major League Baseball and Minor League Bas Baseball have operated under, that was sort of the last dramatic negotiation between the two sides. And Minor League Baseball was so convinced that they had lost that negotiation, it led to a leadership change at the top. They, they actually ended up with a new president of minor league baseball as a result. But ironically, what actually came out of that negotiation was a focus on facilities, which led to a ballpark boom. Uh, there was a significant number of new and or remodeled stadiums that occurred following uh, the 1990 PBA. Um, you know, you see a spike really beginning in 92 to 98 of a lot of facilities uh, in the minor league landscape being built. There was also at that time a change in player compensation. Previously, there had been uh, a sharing of that expense. Uh, the, the minor league teams would actually contribute to the player salaries. Uh, and now, of course, that is a very front and center issue, which, uh, which we will get to. But it was at that time that the parent clubs accepted full responsibility of player compensation. So all of that as background to today. And I think the question of who is at fault for these changes or why did these changes come about is really a matter of perspective. And, and I think there are a number of, a number of things to consider here. Uh, and, and the question really is just, do you view these items as a frustration on the part of Major League Baseball that maybe they need to deal with or an actual failure on the part of minor league baseball to address real tangible issues? So these are, these are the, the core issues that led to the changes. Um, there, the player development contracts that we just talked about were very short term. They were really two years. Um, and two-year agreements left the parent clubs with very little leverage to improve facilities. Uh, and alongside of that, the minor league baseball power structure really was set up to inhibit franchise movement and, and prevent changes in the level of play. 
And, and if you're looking for a smoking gun on this in terms of minor league baseball failing to deal with real issues in their own house, this is it. Um, there was a desire on the part of minor league owners and uh, the minor league office, as well as the league offices in minor league baseball to ensure that if an owner owned a franchise at a certain level of play, that they were allowed to maintain that level of play as long as they own the club, regardless of facility issues, market concerns, um, really anything. And so that created um, problems in terms of moving teams to markets that would make more sense, either as league partners uh, or as, as uh, facilities relate. And so what you found finally was there started to be some movement in that area, but it was because the major league clubs were actually forcing it. So great example is the California league where we saw uh, the team in high desert and the team in Bakersfield both leave the Cal league uh, and go to the Carolina league. Both of those clubs were purchased by major league clubs because they found themselves the last team standing in the musical chairs situation every year. And so finally, just out of frustration, they said, we're done with this. We're going to buy a team. We're going to put it over here. And then we don't have to think about this anymore. So alongside that issue, which was major, um, you also had issues like schedules, travel arrangements, all-star games. These were things that were designed by leagues, and by minor league baseball uh, with business needs in mind, not players. So that becomes a frustration within player development circles of, you know, I feel like my players are on an overnight bus trip twice a week. I would really prefer that they're getting real sleep. Well, the answer to that is, sorry, but we're not gonna play an afternoon game on a Thursday. Um, sorry, but you know, the league has an all-star game. So we need to shuttle these guys halfway across the country. And then as soon as they're done playing, we're going to send them back out so they can rejoin their team. Un understandably that frustrated major league baseball. Uh, in addition, major league baseball was receiving no revenue from minor league operate operations. Meanwhile, major league owners look at their counterparts in the NBA and they see the success of the National Basketball Development League, which is the NBA's minor league, and that's fully league owned and revenues go back to the teams. And so they're looking at what they view as their peers and saying, well, we should have that system. And that is, would be a frustration. Finally, the question of how many players are necessary, right? So the old scout adage, which is, for the most part true, is 25 guys dress so two can play. And you run into a scenario where you're looking at player development and you know and understand that most of these guys uh, really don't have the potential to be a big league player. So why, why is it in our best interest uh, to have all of them, right? So these were the factors that led to the changes. So what happened? So this was the announcement yesterday. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of details that we could get into um, for the purpose of this, I'm really just sharing it to, to make some uh, relatively uh, small comments in terms of the changes. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of focus here on creating league divisions that uh, in theory will ease the amount of travel or the distance travel by teams. There's a lot of focus on, on regional uh, relationships there. And uh, the other thing, which, which were, we discussed the lack of revenue, you know, you're noting that there are placeholder names uh, within this. I fully expect that we will see these leagues with some type of corporate sponsorship attached to them in the form of naming rights. Uh, so 
the expectation would be, um, you know, corporate name double A central, for example, um, could be the uh, could be the direction that this is going. So um, that is this is the list of the 120 teams that will be moving forward uh, with 30 clubs at each level of play, low A, high A, double A, triple A. So we get back to Dennis's, uh, Dennis's name for this presentation, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what's, what's good about this? What is good about the changes that Major League Baseball is creating? So in my opinion, reduced travel, this is, this is actually the rare good for everyone change and is something that I, when I worked in St. Paul, felt as a league, the American Association should have adopted as an independent league a long time ago. Um, reduced travel. So the tighter geographic locations that we just focused on is one element. The other is they're going to do six game series. So you as a club should be traveling. Now you still have the same number of hotel nights, but traveling half as much which means you have half as many bus trips, which means your busing bill every year is half as much. Now, the six game series concept is also a way for the minor league operators to protect their business interests. I talked about clubs not wanting to play on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, the reason for that is you're gonna do dollar beer night on Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Well, one of the rules that Major League Baseball is introducing is you are not allowed uh, to begin a game after a certain time of day if you are traveling outside of a 250 mile radius the next day. There's a lot of trips in minor league baseball that are longer than 250 miles. So what's the solution? The solution is to build in a weekly travel day. That allows clubs to fully uh, select whatever, uh, whatever game start time that they want based on how they wanna operate their business. So this is, this is really good. And the, and the only negative here is actually really just the 4th of July. Um, typically leagues would configure 4th of July schedules so that every team in the league was able to hold a 4th of July celebration of some kind. It's typically your biggest night of the year. Um, and so losing that will sacrifice a little, but the advantage on the backside is essentially, you're probably never gonna play a home game on a Monday, which is fabulous. It's always the, the toughest day to sell tickets and every other game that you wanna schedule, you're gonna be able to pick your game time, which is great. Uh, there's a focus on facilities as they affect players. This is a good thing for baseball. Facilities have come a long way over time. Uh, however, whenever you're negotiating uh, changes with your landlord, which is typically a local municipality, as an operator, your list of priorities always stop, starts with things that affect your business. So um, anything that you can do to operate more efficiently as a business, whether that's concessions, whether that's ticket sales, whether that's uh, you name it, if it, can, if it can improve your top and bottom line, that's gonna go to the top of your list. Updating the home clubhouse typically will get shuffled somewhere near the bottom uh, as long as you've got other improvements that you need. Uh, Long-term affiliations, this is fantastic, 10 years. So I mentioned that the two-year PDCs, that was always bad for the big league clubs. It was also, for many of the minor league teams, it was also a negative because you had a lot of churn. Turnover to a local market signifies instability. Instability signifies weakness. Weakness means people think that you have an inferior product. So they're going to buy fewer tickets. Tenure, tenure affiliations solidify that. It allow you to really market who your parent club is for the long term. And then finally, uh, the increased marketing capacity that Major League Baseball brings to the table really can't be understated here. You've got uh, baseball advanced media, which is extremely powerful, coming in alongside this, it's going to mean 
that more national baseball fans who maybe don't live in a minor league market and haven't thought much about the minor leagues are going to get increased exposure to minor league baseball uh, and the players there. There's also incentive here for Major League Baseball. Uh, Major League Baseball is taking in, will begin taking in the ticket tax uh, that used to go to minor league baseball in St. Petersburg uh, at the same rate, right? So major league baseball is now really a partner inside of selling tickets at minor league games. And they are absolutely going to unleash the, their marketing power to support that. And the other component is they have incentive or incentive around corporate partners. We will absolutely within the next couple of years, see, uh, see corporate partners come on board as the official uh, car of baseball, not major league baseball, the official car of baseball. Those are the sorts of things that, that MLB is interested in. Um, so I'll take, a, I'll take a pause here, Dennis, to catch up if there's any questions in the chat or any questions on uh, what, what I perceive to be the good aspects of, of these changes. Sorry, I was on mute there. Yeah, we do have a, a couple of questions from the a little bit, but uh, it mentioned with with travel, um, David threw out the Bowling Green Hot Rods. Uh, They're in the Northeast High A, and they still have significant travel. Is there is there going to be discrepancies between different teams that are still going to get hit with more travel than others? So it's very astute, but the Bowling Green. Uh, is, is the outlier. There, there's no question uh, about that. And the challenge for that market specifically is they would be the outlier in any league you would look to place them in with the exception of the Southern League. Um, and so unless a major league club raised their hand and said, we want Bowling Green as our AA affiliate, um, the reality was for them to stay in, they were going to be the, the difficult travel partner to fit in. Um, and it related to this is the big league clubs, and, and we'll, we'll touch on this a lot when we talk about how this specifically affects Chicago and Milwaukee, um, but the big league clubs had a lot of autonomy on selecting their affiliates. Essentially, Major League Baseball went to them and said, if you wanna keep your affiliates, you are welcome to do that. And then they figured everything else out. There's, there's definitely an alternate universe here where uh, Park Avenue was a lot more efficient and cutthroat about how this occurred and where they would have simply said, look, here's a cluster of teams. If you pick one of these teams, this is the league it's going to be in. Uh, and, and then moved on from there. And, and I think you would have had, uh, there would have been a lot different shape to the outcome here, particularly, not necessarily uh, in terms of the teams selected, but their level of play in leagues would have been vastly different. Okay. Yeah, and just a few other questions you mentioned about the, the 10 year uh, PDCs. Another question, I'm kind of worried about the minor leagues not having set schedules right now, and maybe you're gonna hint at this a little bit later, what changes might we see to the game this specific season? Uh, we, don't, we don't know yet. That, that really is all, um, it's all stuck with the pandemic, to be honest. I, I expect AAA will play close to a full schedule this year based on what I've heard. I don't know um, about the levels lower than that. And my understanding of the schedule this year is that they're probably done. They're just not announced. Uh, so I, I would expect late, pretty soon uh, we'll get a AAA schedule and then the rest of them, I, I'm, I'm uncertain. Okay. Yeah, and one more from the chat, and we'll let you go back with it. And this this relates a little bit to COVID. I have an opportunity to purchase a season ticket for the Somerset Patriots Double A Yankee affiliate. They were an independent team in the Atlantic League. Not sure what to do, being that we don't know when fans will be allowed back into the park. Is there any <laughs> any news of that hitting the minor leagues? I, I would I would just simply ask them what their what their policy is going to be on uh, schedule before before purchasing, if it were me, so. Great, perfect. Well, those are the chat questions for right now. Okay, great. Uh, so how about, 
how about the bad here? Um, so things that I believe are net negatives. Um, someone, someone's able to draw on the screen. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> so net, net negatives for baseball. Uh, there's a lot of disruption and elimination of longtime affiliations and league partners. So it's not just did your affiliation change. It's also, you know, fans who've gone to games for 20 plus years like having familiar opponents. It's just a fact. Um, whether, whether or not that should matter is probably a different conversation, but the fact is it does. So that disruption really creates the perception of instability. And as I referenced around two year PDCs, the perception of instability is bad for business. And, and you've got within this, you've also got people who had to drop a level, right? So uh, the most notable club there uh, is the Fresno Grizzlies who've gone from AAA to A ball. And from a business perspective, as someone who worked in minor league baseball for a very long time, there's a degree of this of if you don't believe in your business operation enough to think that changing level of play isn't going to affect it, then you don't maybe don't have a great business plan. At the same time, there is going to be the perception in the market of what well, we used to be a triple A market and now we're not. So what does that say about us as a community? What does that say about the organization that they weren't allowed to be there? So that's, that's part of how that all comes out and, and how it would be a negative. There's no doubt that what we're creating here is also a more homogeneous product. Uh, baseball is going to become incredibly similar no matter where you are. Uh, so I, I think that increasingly minor league teams are gonna really truly become franchise type operations. And I think if you want to take the cynical view uh, about Major League Baseball's increased involvement here, you could say, well, they've got 10 years now to figure out how to make this business really work for them, how to sell tickets without having much of a ticket sale staff, how to sell corporate partnerships at scale on a nationwide level without having to rely on local revenues. Right. And if that were to come to fruition, the natural trickle down of that is very, very little local engagement with the minor league club because the business can operate without it. Right. That is a that is a tremendous danger, I think, to all fans in that way. The other thing is Major League Baseball, I, I touched on the, the good part of facilities. The bad part on the facilities is within these agreements, Major League Baseball now has the ability to insert itself into discussions with municipalities, with the landlords of these facilities to negotiate facility improvements directly, which means if I'm the operator who used to walk into these negotiations and say, boy, we haven't replaced the seats in 10 years, we really need new seats, that might be the top of my list. The top of Major League Baseball's list is going to be, uh, well, actually, we need uh, we need a nap room for the players. Um, we need to expand the batting cages, and we need to add a pitching tunnel. Right? That those are the things that uh, the players need, and there is a lot of friction there. And there's a lot of reason to believe that the minor league operators are going to get their needs shuffled to the bottom, and ultimately while minor league baseball operators are looking out for their business, they're looking out for the things that benefit fans because that's what benefits their business. And, and this is to me a net negative for the fans. Any new questions here, Bill? Um, we do. Um, the, do you have any reason to believe that this minor league baseball contraction is simply oops, simply an, an interim step and that further changes and cuts might be made at the end of this PDC? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's another cynical view to take. Um, I think it could be more likely that Major League Baseball wants to use this um, expanded influence and control to slowly own all of the teams themselves. 
Um, there is quite a bit of investment already on behalf of major league clubs. And there has been for quite a while. Um, the Braves and the Cardinals have been longtime investors in their minor league affiliates and systems. Um, the, the Mariners are investors uh, in a couple of different markets. The Astros under, um, under their current owner uh, adopted that strategy. So they own the team in Corpus Christi. They own the team in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, and they are now partners uh, in Sugarland. Um, but you're seeing as a result of these changes, you're seeing new investment come in. And I think that's where, um, again, if you want to take the cynical view on this, I, I think I would, I would understand why. Um, and I think there's reason to believe that over time, there's interest in having major league owners really control um, all of the minor league businesses. Okay. We actually have one from Twitter. So we're working multiple screens here. Uh, and this one's a, a little bit more of a, a, a big picture issue, but dealing with the history of the minor leagues. Uh, you know, some leagues like the Midwest League wouldn't be a problem, but the high A East, you're combining several leagues into one. How is history, how would Sabre look at the history of that? Yeah, it's, it's as I said, I, I don't think we should expect any of those league names to survive. So the South Atlantic League, which has been around forever, uh, the Pacific Coast League, which has an amazing heritage and history, um, I, I don't expect those names to continue to be around. And you look at, you know, at, at, so this, the High A East actually touches on a couple of, couple of different components here. I touched on team investment. Um, I believe that the High A East has one of, and I'm not looking at the screen right now, but I believe it has one of either uh, the Hickory Crawdads or uh, the Down East Wood Ducks. And those teams are both in North Carolina, both owned at least in part by the Texas Rangers. And that last little part prevented them from being in the same league. And that creates another logistical headache in terms of how do we commit to uh, reducing travel while also accommodating the fact that we cannot disrupt our own owners uh, stakes in these clubs. Uh, you know, the, the Braves, the Braves had a, have similar issues, but definitely to a lesser extent than the, than the Rangers ownership stake created. Perfect. Well, yeah, we will get back to some of these others later. So feel free. Run okay. with it. Yep. Perfect. Uh, oop, and I went too far. Let's, uh, let's see if we can go back. All right. The ugly. So, <clears throat> There's, there's, really, there's really no positive way to spin uh, having 162 teams and going to 120, right? Uh, for, for all of the talk about um, everything else that could be good about this, uh, feels like probably could be accomplished without eliminating 40 clubs, right? So to me, that's bad in every way. Uh, we're also going to reduce the number of minor league players as a result. So teams are going to have uh, a maximum of 180 minor league players under contract. Um, I believe that last year the Yankees had the most and they were, um, they were in the 220s or 230s. So this is a significant number of players who now are looking around wondering what's next. Um, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of presentation um, on the part of Major League Baseball about continuing to offer baseball in the markets affected by the reduction. And it's a noble effort. Um, I don't know that all of these replacement leagues are set up for success. Um, and I would, I would point specifically to the new Pioneer League, which is being launched as an independent league uh, and one of Major League Baseball's partner leagues. Uh, they've got several independent leagues that are partner leagues. The challenge in the Pioneer League is you are working in markets that um, they're not very big. They're just not. And there isn't the corporate support um, to consistently bring in um, group outings, selling suites, selling advertising at a scale that drives revenue. But going to independent baseball, 
means you're taking on a lot more overhead than you used to. You don't have a parent club partner uh, who can assist if you want to improve player facilities. You will be taking on the salaries of the players on your own. These, these increased costs to me, um, along with the negative perception that's going to be created in the market around going from affiliated ball to independent ball, uh, is going to put those clubs in a tenuous position. Um, and, and so I, I've, I've got big time question marks about the Pioneer League. Um, the new prospect league is interesting. It, it's got the full backing of Major League Baseball, but it's still a trial balloon. You know, we're essentially saying that we're going to give fringe draft pros prospects the opportunity to play in this league for a period of time right before the draft. I'm not, I'm not certain that they're going to be able to bring in the caliber of player that is going to sustain that league, but that remains to be seen. Um, and then the final thing here that creates some question marks, there's, there's a proliferation of collegiate wood bat leagues that's, that's coming out of this as a result. And I'm uncertain that that's, um, that that's a good thing. Um, we have a number of very established collegiate wood bat leagues across the country already. Um, how many more can be supported? So what, what we're really going to ask, both with the addition of collegiate wood bat leagues and, and increased independent league baseball, is what is the cultural carrying capacity of the baseball ecosystem to continue to add players at what most would consider the lowest level of play, right? And, and it's a question of, how many baseball players are there out there who are willing to do this uh, in the most difficult places? So I question that. And then finally, a reduction of draft rounds. So we saw this, um, we saw this this year, mostly as a response to the pandemic, they reduced the draft to five rounds. Um, their intention, Major League Baseball's intention is still to have a reduction in the draft uh, and make it a 20 to maybe 30 round draft uh, previously it had been 40. So again, we're, we're continuing to pull back. There's, there's less, there's less, there's less. Um, you know, and it's, it's not a great sign that the strongest player in the baseball industry, um, is making an argument that there should be less baseball. Okay. Questions. We have we have time for questions, and then and then I, we've got time to uh, uh, confirm that Stu was right about the trivia, and then we'll move on to uh, Chicago and Milwaukee uh, specific items. Sure. So I, I still have a few from the chat. Let me just throw out one if, before we open it up to everybody else. But what happens if the city that owns a minor league ballpark? doesn't have the finances, the money on hand to make the improvements sought by the major league club. Yeah, so within these 10 year agreements, major league baseball absolutely has the ability to opt out if the facilities no longer meet their standards. And so I believe that the effect of this will be much like the 1990 negotiation in which we are going to enter into a new era of a lot of minor league facilities uh, either being significantly renovated or new ones built. Okay. And maybe one more. What changes will we see in minor league broadcasting, radio, TV, and streaming? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that's one area where BAM is going to be able to have a great deal of influence. Um, I, I don't think that broadcasters will change much. I, I don't know that Major League Baseball has an interest in, in getting into dealing with who's the radio guy for the Carolina Mudcats. But I do think that they will have an interest in making sure that the streaming products, um, that the quality is increased and that the, that they are tremendously more accessible to more people. So I would expect that if you, if you want to follow, you know, a certain player because he's the hot prospect for your club, I think that will get significantly easier moving forward. Okay. Do we want to open up to ask questions directly and I can filter in some of the chat around that? Sounds good. Yeah, that works for me.
questions, anybody? The floor yeah. is yours. Okay, you've got, um, you know, the rookie league for kids coming right out of high school or what was short season. Is, are those being replaced kind of by the partner leagues? Is that kind of what the Pioneer League is there to do? Uh, I think to a degree, uh, but for players actually under contract, um, the Gulf Coast League will still exist um, as, as well as um, uh, the facilities leagues out here in Arizona, right? So what you're going to see is if you've got a guy, let's say you've got that 18-year-old high school kid um, who traditionally gets sent to Billings, Montana, Fishkill, New York, someplace like that, um, they're going to, they're going to instead spend time at the facility, really be under, under the watch and care of staff day to day before they get sent on an assignment to uh, travel and play games. Uh, they'll play games in these facility leagues, obviously, but uh, yeah, but the partner leagues, I don't know, Stu, that I fully understand what, um, what the partnership is, uh, to be honest, other than, maybe the league making sure that if there are additional changes that they're not left behind. Scott? Uh, this is Richard Smiley. Uh, so there's really no benefit at all in the past league names. I'm figuring even like, okay, Chick-fil-A, you know, uh, the Southern League presented by Chick-fil-A. There's no way they could use at least some of the most historic names. I'm surprised at that. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, I don't disagree with you at all, Richard. Uh, and I, I hope, I, particularly, I really hope that the South Atlantic League and the, and the Pacific Coast League names are, are able to, to maintain for a period of time. But, you know, it feels, feels like they had the opportunity to, to keep that there. Um, and they've already, they've already gone with placeholder language. So we'll see. As a tangent to that question, does MLB own the trademarks for those minor league names? And if not, what would it take for them to get those? Yeah, um, wonderful question. Um, as of now, the minor league baseball office still exists. So it's still a legal entity um, that would have the rights to various trademarks. Um, what I don't know is whether they hold league trademarks or the league itself does. Um, I legitimately don't understand that uh, um, just because I don't have the knowledge of it. But ultimately, it may not matter because minor league baseball as an entity at some point later this year won't exist. Um, it will be disbanded and fold. Um, and so the trickle down of that you know, and, and the leagues are the same, right? So you get into areas of copyright, copyright and trademark law that I'm not really well versed on. Hi, right, Carrie. Hey, two questions. One you may not be able to answer. One, with a team like the Schomburg Boomers, who are going to kind of fill that gap of the lost 40 teams, what are they going to be able to um, sell a player kind of going back to the old branch Ricky days to a major league team for to quote unquote kind of pay for their funding or support is is one of the things I'm curious about and then two what happens to the uh and I have not seen much news on it but like the Burlington Bees the Clinton Lumber Kings that just got kind of thrown to the side what happens to them in terms of, uh, can I call it loyalty or cost in uh, regards to, hey, you, you, you took or, or you know, sold my, my team, you know, I paid $3 million for it, now it's worth nothing. What's gonna happen with uh, that in Major League Baseball? Have you heard anything? Yeah, so uh, the first question first, and this is the perfect transition uh, into the reason I, I posed the trivia question. So, um, Per, the purchase of player contracts from independent league teams has not changed really since indie ball came back in the early to mid nineties. Um, I believe that at that time 
teams were paid somewhere between three and five thousand uh, dollars for the purchase of a player contract. Uh, and in 2020, that is the same. Uh, and I do not expect there to be any opportunity because of the lack, lack of leverage for independent league teams um, to ask for more. So for that reason, it's actually in Major League Baseball's best interest for there to be a lot of independent leagues. Um, because if there are, then it reduces the, uh, the leverage opportunity for any single um, team to sell a player. So this connects, and I'll get back to the, the question of some of these other Midwest League teams. So this connects with um, the Mike Lansing question. So the Miami Miracle, as Stu informed us, were the team that drafted and signed Mike Lansing. The Miami Miracle participated in the Rule 4 draft, which is just the first year draft, um, in 1990 because that rule, which was in place when there were, during the golden age of minor league baseball, and there were almost exclusively independent league teams, it allowed the minor league clubs to participate in the draft. The Miracle, along with the Erie Seawolves, exercised that right in 1990. Um, and the Miracle picked uh, 16 players, including Paul Carey and Mike Lansing, who both made the big leagues um, and signed 15 of them. Erie actually only drafted one player, so it was more of a footnote. Um, but what Miami did was they drafted Mike Lansing, then they sold him to the Expos. Uh, and at the time, no one else was doing that. There, there really wasn't anyone else who uh, had the wherewithal to pick someone who could actually be a prospect at the time. And Mike Lansing was a legitimate prospect. So uh, an, an interesting thing there. And so today, I actually thought it would have been a savvy move um, this year because of the five round draft, which Major League Baseball then followed up by putting a cap on the bonus that you could give to an, an undrafted uh, first year free agent. I thought it would have been a really savvy move for a collection of indie ball clubs to create a co-op and go out with a bonus pool where they sign sort of the next tier of guys for more than they would have otherwise gotten and then held firm uh, and done a posting system like we see from Korea and Japan, where once, once the initial bonus gets covered, they could split um, anything over that with the player. So the player could make more money up front and get a second bonus when they get sold to a major league organization. Um, unfortunately, I think the pandemic really limited that as a viable option, but I think there is an opportunity if independent leagues want to figure something out, I think that they have more of a role to play today in the player development system and um, getting them, getting players into affiliated ball than they did a year ago um, because of these changes. Um, so your second question, what's gonna happen with these other teams? Many of them have already joined other leagues. Um, one example being Kane County, um, who is now part of the American Association. Um, others, in the Midwest League, and, and you referenced Burlington, you know, and Iowa was particularly hard hit um, in the reduction of clubs. You know, I, those Iowa teams are very similar, in my opinion, to the Pioneer League clubs that I'm worried about being able to handle independent league baseball. Um, so I know that there have been plans announced, but I'm, I'm not, I can't remember exactly what they are. Well, I have one from the chat. Isn't saying 160 is now 120, actually saying that independent minor leagues either don't matter or are simply unsustainable. Mm. Uh, no, it's it's simply saying that they're not part of the major league baseball player development system. Okay. And, and one more from the chat. Any chance of antitrust lawsuits? Seems inevitable. Um and we know that there's a lawsuit in Staten Island. Um, there may be a lawsuit coming out of um, Lancaster, California. We'll see. Um, it, it has survived a very long time. So I'm certainly not going to predict that it's going to be the exemption would be removed. Um, but it's getting more difficult to make the argument um, that businesses are not affected by this monopoly. 
Uh, so we'll see. Bill, as a person who has always been rather cynical with uh, Major League Baseball, everything they do is really a money grab, something for revenue. Are the minor leagues going to become their place to experiment with things that most of us probably would detest? Like, oh, let's put logos and on uniforms and, and all these different things that uh, let's see how that flies and then bring it up to the big leagues. Well, so I, I will say, um, as someone who worked in minor league ball uh, and independent ball, where we were often accused of being willing to sell anything that wasn't nailed down, um, it is it is ironic to me uh, that the league names have immediately disappeared. Um, and and you know, I'm, I'm not a I'm certainly not a traditionalist, so you know, uh, corporate sponsors on uniforms wouldn't really bother me, um, but. It is, it is a little bit amusing uh, to me to see those, those um, capitalist changes be implemented uh, at the minor league levels first. So uh, I, we've got, I know we're running out of time here, so I'm gonna try to get to the um, Chicago and Milwaukee stuff. So the White Sox were one of the teams that really stuck with uh, everyone they'd been working with. They've been in Charlotte for quite a while. Uh, Charlotte has a first class ballpark. So they, they, they stayed there. They've also stayed in Birmingham where they've been for a very long time, uh, including when Michael Jordan played there. Uh, and they've stayed in Winston Salem and Kannapolis. Those, those two, um, actually swapped levels of play. Um, so, Whichever was low A, which I think was Kannapolis, is now high A, and Winston-Salem was high A and is now low A. That's a pretty immaterial change. Uh, and of course, they did drop their short season uh, Pioneer League affiliate, which was in Great Falls. The Cubs, similarly, uh, incredibly stable and not a lot of changes. They've been in Des Moines with the Iowa Cubs forever. Uh, so they're sticking there. They're, they're staying with the Tennessee Smokies, which uh, for a little bit was uh, ten, th that team could have been on the chopping block. Uh, they're staying in South Bend and they're staying in Myrtle Beach. Again, uh, Myrtle Beach was their high A, it's now their low A, South Bend, vice versa. Um, their short season affiliate was in Eugene with the Emeralds, uh, which they dropped, but the A's actually picked it up as a full season A affiliate. So, um, so no changes there. And then I mentioned King County to the American Association and th this, um, this is interesting to me. You know, the, the Cubs already had South Bend uh, and obviously any league that South Bend was in, Kane County would have been in as well. Um, so the Cubs didn't really have the opportunity to do anything uh, for Kane County. The White Sox absolutely did. Um, it would have meant leaving Winston-Salem or Kannapolis. Um, but if, if the White Sox said, you know what, we, we want to make sure that the Chicago land continues to have uh, affiliated baseball, they, they could have said, hey, we want to, we want to be in King County. Um, so that's the Chicago update. In Milwaukee, um, they had minimal changes uh, at the AAA level. They've swapped out San Antonio in favor of Nashville. Um, San Antonio is no longer uh, AAA, uh, and they kept – they kept everything else. Um, again, a swap of level of play with uh, Carolina going to low A and, and the Timber Rattlers going to high A. And then they, and then they dropped their Pioneer League affiliate, uh, which was Colorado Springs. Uh, so then in closing, you know, a couple of the clubs that I think probably best reflect the intent of the changes, um, probably the Twins and the Marlins. Of course, I said Florida Marlins, it's Miami Marlins. Uh, Apologies for the typo. Um, so the, the twins, uh, the twins were in Rochester. They swapped it for St. Paul, uh, St. Paul going from Indy ball all the way to AAA. Um, they, along with Sugarland, Summer and Somerset, um, which we talked about previously, were the three independent league clubs to join. Uh, they also swapped Pensacola for Wichita, which from a travel perspective for staff was a, was a great win. Wichita, uh, I feel bad for their market. Uh, the Wichita franchise had relocated from New Orleans as a AAA club, never played a game at their brand new stadium last year due to the pandemic. And when they open, they will instead open as a AA affiliate uh, instead of AAA. The Marlins uh, were part of 
this, this horse trading with the Twins. Uh, they swapped out Wichita slash New Orleans as their AAA for Jacksonville, with Jacksonville making the jump from AA to AAA. And then Jacksonville, which had been their AA, uh, the Marlins got Pensacola. So they went, they went from um, having to get to Wichita for AAA to putting that in Jacksonville, uh, which was a good thing, uh, and then kept their AA within the state of Florida. So um, good, good for uh, their player development staff to be able to get to the clubs. It will be interesting, Scott. Other questions? Yeah, how much time do you got, Scott? If we have a couple more questions. Oh, Josh, Josh is right uh, about, about Eugene. Uh, they were picked up by the Giants, not the A's. That's correct. He mentioned that in the chat. Uh, Scott, I think you closed your presentation with something that uh, I think is a little scary. The Major League Baseball is promoting less baseball, uh, in essence, by dropping from 160 to 120 teams. And uh, that, I think, was my concern all along with this. Uh, I think a lot of the minor league cities, uh, the fans there developed allegiances to the major league teams. Uh, and young people saw baseball. Are some teams, the city's not going to have that ability? Are we not going to develop the baseball fans with these kids? Um, you know, it's the McDonald'sizing of the world. Whatever the kids like when they're 10 years old, six years old, uh, carries forward for a long time. So, so I, I think that that's a scary thought when you said that. Yeah, and it remains to be seen how what the what the fallout's going to be. Um, I, I do think there's opportunity for the independent leagues to uh, expand their influence in baseball, um, but we will see if Major League Baseball has any interest in allowing that to happen. So, yeah, I agree. Scott, thank you very much. I can't think of anybody who could have done this better. You understand this market much better than any of us in Sabre probably because of your experiences. So um, very timely and I really appreciate your coming on to do this today. Well, thanks for having me. You bet. Cool. Thanks. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I was going to, should we take a five minute uh, break before we continue since uh, uh, everybody could probably, there's a few of us who probably could use a run to another room in the building here in the house. I don't have to tell you where to find those, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, Dennis, I think it's a good idea, but could I ask also, while folks are on break, could you promote Sean Gibson and Scott Simkus and uh, Mark Armour and Larry Lester to co-host? I can. Got to find them on the screen here. I'll be glad to do so. Okay. Yeah, it's a long list today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then uh, if if our panelists haven't disappeared yet, let me just give a quick sound check with, with any of them that are on at the moment. So uh, Scott Simkus, maybe just uh, unmute and say something. We'll make sure it's working. Yeah, hey. Perfect. Good. We can hear you. Afternoon. Can you hear me? You passed. And then let's see, Sean Gibson. If you are on, uh, say a little bit, just a couple words on sound check. Good morning. Can you hear me? Does how's that sound? Loud and clear. Fantastic. Very good. Okay, Mark Armour. Nope. Mm. Yola Tango. Oh, perfect. Okay, gotcha. All right. Okay. And Larry Lester, sir, if you are on with us. Check, check. One, two, three. We've there got we you. Okay. The only one I haven't found is Scott. Where are you? Mm -hmm. Alphabetical by first name. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Where did he go? Scott, say something so you highlight. Uh, I'm here. Can you see me? Help. 
<laughs> I'm right next to you, Dennis, uh, on my screen. I just... <laughs> Yeah, and I've, I've got him the first person who's not a co-host on my screen, but I don't think I have the superpower to, to promote right. him. Should I make your, let me see. Are you, the, are you the baseball card, Jason Schwartz? I am, yes. Hey, Jason, I just made you a host, so maybe you can do it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, let me see what I can do here. Uh, Scott, uh, make co-host. Um, I think it worked. Let me try one more time. Mm, maybe we're limited to only one Scott as co-host. <laughs> oh, wait, here we go. Here we go. You can remove me as, uh, you can there, I see it. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, everybody. I think we've done it. And then Dennis, um, maybe what we'll do and we'll try to keep it brief. Uh, since I know our panelists, some of them have multiple commitments today, yeah. it, we can just run through a few quick announcements yep. uh, before we jump in. Uh, yeah. so. I missed the first half hour for another webcast. Where can I pick it up later? Uh, pretty sure we'll have this on YouTube probably within just a couple of days. Yep, they turn those around fairly quickly, so. Yeah. All right, well, why don't we, uh, in the interest of time, why don't we roll into some announcements? I'll, I'll just start on behalf of uh, Chicago chapter and so many of the attendees who are here today. I'll just note, I believe our next big event is March 20th. We're hosting Chicago Cub Bob Dernier. So that that's a huge one for us. We're really excited about that. Uh, and if you have a chance to make it, I'm pretty sure you won't be disappointed. Um, Bill, anything else you can think of for Chicago chapter? Uh, if that's for the Chicago chapter. We're working on an April date. Uh, we will be highlighting the recent Comiskey Park book and the bio project, but more details on that to come. So, but one announcement for overall Saber, please make sure you go to the website, click on publications and take a look at the latest and greatest books that our volunteers are producing. And you can, if you're not a member and you're on this call, you can go there, add your email address and find out about all the publications coming out soon. Fantastic. And then Scott Bush, if you're still on with us, did you want to make a little pitch for the Sabre Analytics Conference? He's muted. He does. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take his pinch hitter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or Mark. Uh... I wonder if Scott is. Oh, sorry, guys. I, uh, okay. I was finding the other room in my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished, I hope. Yeah. Yes. That shouldn't take analytics. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Scott, did you want to say anything about the upcoming analytics conference? I do, I do. So uh, we are March 11 through 14 and fully virtual. And the exciting thing about going virtual is if you've ever wondered what happens at the analytics conference or what it's all about, it uh, gives you the chance to, uh, to check it out from your living room um, or any other room from your, uh, from your home if you would like. Uh, and we've got a lot of great research lined up, including some of really the, the hottest topics in baseball at the moment, such as the construction of the baseball uh, and the, the new hottest physics element in pitching, seam shifted wake, uh, which answers a lot of the questions around uh, why some pitchers have so much great late movement uh, and others maybe do not. So um, if you're at all intrigued by that, go ahead and, uh, and get registered and check it out. Uh, Scott, real quick on the convention, how does that look for this summer? Uh, I, would expect, I would expect some news on that front next week. Okay. Cool. Okay, and then, and then Dennis, as our overall host, any announcements on behalf of the Keltner chapter? Yeah, I've got a few here. Um, okay. We've got a, uh, our next, we got another virtual chapter meeting on February 25th, uh, titled Doc Adams, A Brief Look at the Life of This Baseball uh, Pioneer. Corky Caskell of the uh, Halsey Hall chapter is doing that. And Marjorie Adams, the great granddaughter, 
is going to be attending as well. Uh, I heard her on the pandemic, no, on the what podcast, uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson's, uh, the, their executive director's podcast, and she was very, very good. Um, then watch for our date in March. We're trying to set up our annual uh, preseason review with uh, BrewersMLB.com um, beat writer, Adam McCulvey. I'm somewhat nervous about trying to lock a date in because I figure we'll jinx the season once we lock it in, but uh, uh, we're looking at a date probably in later March and hopefully we'll have a season. Um, and then our book club meeting, uh, we just had a book club meeting earlier this week. We were talking about having the meeting on uh, our next meeting on April 7th. That date has been filled. So we're moving it up to March 31st and we will be discussing the book K, A History of Baseball in 10 Pitches. Uh, I know Mary Shea, who heads up our book club, is, I think, maybe finished it, and she said it's a fascinating book to read. And then finally, getting outside our chapter, but going to our neighbor, Halsey Hall, they're having a book club meeting on April 3rd at 9.30 in the morning with Jane Levy to discuss squeeze play. Uh, Jane joined us in December for our book club meeting. It was a very, it was a one of the best meetings we've had and uh, uh, discussing this book could be very interesting since it's a novel she wrote and we're all asking, so who really are these guys? Because how much of this is, you know, true. So, so those are the highlights I have. Okay. In that case, I think we may be ready to jump right in. I'm going to share my screen just briefly. Um, it's just one slide, but this will facilitate some of our introductions. So, this is really a great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, just an absolute all-star panel uh, to reflect on the Major League Baseball announcement back in December on essentially the recognition or promotion of the Negro Leagues or selected Negro Leagues to Major Leagues. Who do we have? We have a national treasure. I hope I don't embarrass him when I say that, but I think a national treasure. Larry Lester, chair of Sabres Negro Leagues Research Committee, a Chadwick Award winner, and oh, by the way, co-founder of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. And the truth is I could probably keep listing, but we'd run out of time. So I'm just gonna uh, summarize with that. Uh, Mark Armour is here, president of Sabre, a Chadwick Award winner and a Bob Davids Award winner also the chair of Sabres Negro League Task Force, which just issued recommendations in the last couple of days. So this is timely. Speaking of timely, by the way, probably not lost on many of you, 101 years ago today, Rube Foster and seven other owners walked into the Paseo YMCA and essentially founded the Negro National League. And sometimes that's considered the birth of the Negro Leagues. So uh, really a lot of history and current events coming together today. From our very own Sabre Chicago chapter, Scott Simkus, an absolute heavyweight in terms of researching records and statistics from the Negro Leagues, also the author of an awesome book called Outsider Baseball. And then, Dennis, I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to see your great granddaughter of Doc Adams and raise you one with the great grandson of Josh Gibson. Sean Gibson is here. It's my pleasure to introduce him, somebody I've gotten to know in the past year and one of my favorite people, executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation and a member of the Gibson family. Your humble hosts will be myself, Jason Schwartz from the Chicago chapter and Bill Perch. We hope we are worthy. Uh, here we go. Jason, if I could break in real quick. Yes. Uh, I will declare you the winner on that one, so. <laughs> yeah, <there you> go. <laughs> no disrespect to Marjorie at all, but right. holy smokes, we got Sean Gibson. Okay, so with that, I'm actually going to stop my share just so I think people have a better view of the speakers as we go. So the first thing I want to ask, and I'll kind of call it out in order, but when the announcement came out, uh, I think it may have been December 18th, it caught a lot of baseball fans by surprise. I literally didn't see it coming at all, and I believe that I had listened a week earlier to Larry Lester on Matt Costello's Pretty Big News podcast, essentially saying he didn't think it would ever happen. So let me just go around and I'm gonna start with Larry. Larry, what was your reaction on December 18th when you saw uh, the MLB announcement? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your panel. Uh, pleasure. Uh, I was shocked, 
surprised, uh, elated that it happened, uh, and some somewhat tearful that uh, it took so long. It's something I've been advocating for many years to happen, and it came about, and I was just uh, just somewhat stunned, uh, for a better word, uh, but I see a lot of positive upside to uh, Major League Baseball recognizing the Negro League. So that was my initial reaction. Okay, fantastic. And, and Scott Simkus, I saw your name, I think, in maybe the first article I read on the topic and, and realized you were uh, here, here in the Chicago area. So that made me yeah. proud. Um, how about yourself? What was your reaction, sir? <clears throat> well, hey, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jason. Um, you know, I knew that uh, there were serious conversations happening um, in major league level, um, and they were they were seriously considering this. Uh, but when the announcement was made, and I found out the night before, uh, like Larry, I was shocked and stunned. I know Larry has been working on this stuff a lot longer than I have. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this 15 years and I was, uh, it was emotional. It was emotional. My yes. grandfather had played against the Cuban stars. And so something that feels um, personal to me about it. And so it was uh, emotional and surprising and it had never been uh, something that I would ever uh, believe would have happened. So I, I think it's, I think it's great. Awesome. And then Sean, let me ask you, um, I think it probably had added significance as, as a family member of not just any Negro League player, but perhaps the best ever. Uh, what was your reaction? Were you expecting it? And how did it feel? And like everybody else said, thanks for having me. Uh, glad to be here to talk to you about this. Uh, one, I was very shocked and surprised. Um, as a matter of fact, I just spoke to Scott maybe a week ago. We had talked and we had uh, discussed this, but um, from the family perspective, you know, we always consider Josh Gibson a major leaguer anyway. So um, for us, it's, it's, it's great that Major League Baseball finally, quote unquote, officially made the announcement. But, you know, we were definitely uh, surprised by the announcement. I kind of found out from my phone ringing um, that morning and uh, were different reporters calling me. And I act like I knew about it, but I didn't know about it. <laughs> so, but... I would just say this, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of things going on in society right now with the whole Black Lives Matters. It was kind of surprising to have this announcement two weeks before the end of the year, uh, with everything going on with the pandemic year it was a great announcement to have, but you know, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of unanswered questions that we're trying to figure out. So, um, you know, it seemed like they made the announcement and that was pretty much it. So there's some things that the families I did get a letter from the commissioner and I got a call from Pat Courtney last week. Well, this week, um, wanted to meet with the families to discuss some things, but uh, overall, you know, like everyone else said, it's exciting that they finally did it. I will say this though, um, you know, I know these guys have done a lot of research and getting this stuff together, but to me, it's kind of too late. It's never too late, but it's kind of too late because all the players who put on the hard work and time are all dead. So it's up to the families that are living to make sure that everything is done right and correctly. But I will say that's the only, I will say that's the only bitter part of it is that I think I talked to Gary Ashwell the other day. I think he said it's four players that's still around from that time. So that's the other sad part about is that, you know, if it was done, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it'd been a lot more players alive. But, uh, but overall, you know, we're just waiting to see what the next steps are. Fantastic. Thank you, Sean. And then Mark, I know even before the announcement, Sabre was already getting ready to uh, research some things and maybe make some recommendations. So what was it like for you to get the news on December 18th? Um, well, I, I would say that um, I was not really surprised by the time the announcement was made. I would, uh, when this was first brought to my attention, there was an article in The Ringer that Ben Lindbergh did over the summer. And when I read that, and I know, I think both Scott and Larry were part of that story, but, um, and when I read that, my, and I even told Scott Bush, not long after that article came out, I just said, you know, there's no way that Major League Baseball 
can say that they're considering um, making the Negro Leagues or recognizing them as major leagues and then come back and say, nah, nah, we decided no. I mean, I, I didn't think that was possible. So to me, it was sort of a matter of time. And I understand and appreciate the emotions and the, and the shock that my fellow panelists, all of whom have a, a lifetime of, of stake in this in a way that I really don't, I am extremely excited and, and, and happy and thrilled for everyone involved. Um, and it's mostly, you know, as, as happy as I am, I understand that it's, it's, it means more to my fellow panelists, I think, because they've been involved in it, you know, more deeply than I have. So let me follow up with this and I'll, I'll offer it up to any of our four panelists. Um, so I'll just I'll just offer my own recommendation when I when I read the news, I thought it was the best thing to happen to baseball in my entire life. And as I read articles that started coming out, I was actually a little bit surprised to see a lot of negative criticism of the announcement, either how it was done or some of the details of it. Um, I know for for our panelists, you've probably seen some of that as well. Um, do you have any response or any thoughts on some of the negativity that accompanied the announcement and, and just anybody who would like to take it? Well, this well, is Larry. I, I welcome <clears throat> the negativity. Uh, it makes my uh, base that much stronger. I think the stats are solid and I'm willing to argue uh, that the Negro Leagues players are the equivalent of major league players all day long. So I say that statistically. And uh, so, you know, bring it on. I mean, I welcome the challenge. Fantastic, anybody else? Yeah, I, uh, I'll jump in. I, you know, I think it's easy to, uh, to be a little bit cynical whenever a major league baseball uh, does something. Um, and oftentimes it's justified uh, especially the last year that we've been through. Um, but if you believe that you need to have a fully audited and balanced uh, statistical record to be uh, classified as a major league, and I happen to believe that you need to, then the fact is Major League Baseball couldn't have made this announcement until 2020. That, that is really the first time that we've had a fully audited and balanced statistical record version 1.0 that didn't occur until last year and this is uh, you know Larry's work uh, is the foundation of what we're seeing and what's being um, uh, recognized now um, and then the, the next generation with Gary and some of the guys that have been working with seam heads we've kind of uh, pushed it across the plate but um, you know I, I, yeah people wish we had done this third 30 years ago when there were still players around, but there wasn't, uh, there wasn't the database. It just didn't exist. There were, there were records that were published in the Macmillan Encyclopedia in the 80s and uh, just not nearly as complete and as thorough and, and uh, as accurate as what, what we have today. So I think uh, some of this is just a byproduct of what was happening culturally uh, with the Black Lives Movement. Um, and, and some of it is just simply a byproduct of it has taken 50 years to rebuild this stuff. It is not easy work. Um, and, and, and so I, that's just a reality we have to accept that, you know, we may have wished this had occurred back in 1975, uh, but there, there just wasn't the record there. And, and now we have it and we should be thankful for it and celebrate it. Uh, I'd like to add some value to what Scott has to say. Uh, all the data from the box scores is manually inputted. You cannot scan a box score into my database. And so it takes between 30 to 45 minutes to put in all the at bats, runs, hits, errors, put outs, innings pitched, so forth and so on. And this is why it has taken us so long. And like Scott said, we're at this point now that we're, we're able to balance the ledger, the stats are solid. Uh, I wish they could have been 10 or 15 years ago authenticated, but this is a manual effort. And we continue to find one or two box scores every year. So I wish it could have happened sooner, but 2020 is, is what it is. So that's why I say the numbers are solid now. So, Fantastic. so Jason, I'd like to 
say something. Um, I, I think one of the, um, I didn't, I, I haven't heard any criticism about whether the new leagues were good enough. I mean, it's possible that there is, is such a thing, but I certainly can't imagine it. I mean, certainly, I, I certainly haven't heard any of that, um, at least publicly. Um, the, the biggest pushback that I read um, on the day or two after the major, major league announcement really revolves around whether Major League Baseball has the standing um, to really be the arbiter of the history. Um, and I sympathize with that, um, honestly, which is, which is really why Sabre decided to investigate this themselves, because Major League Baseball isn't just a bunch of historians. Major League Baseball are, is the organization who both necessitated the Negro Leagues in the first place and ultimately destroyed the Negro Leagues. So I think it was a little bit off-putting for some commentators to say like, why are you the people who are making this decision? And I think as an historian, I do sympathize with the idea that actors in a, in a, in a history are in charge of the history itself. Like, I don't think a, a uh, presidential historian would go to the White House and say, so tell us how we should write this, right? Um, and I think that Saber's view on this, the reason why we started the task force was ultimately history is owned by the historians and that would be Saber, uh, Retro Sheet, uh, the Negro Leagues Museum, the Hall of Fame, um, and, uh, and you know, baseballreference.com, and, and the people that are actually in charge of organizing the history should be the historians and not people who essentially were the actors in the story. And I think that Major League Baseball got that pushback because of, of that. Um, whether you agree or disagree with that, um, whether they deserve the pushback, I think that was the issue is sort of the greater issue of that baseball historians have largely ceded to Major League Baseball the power to be the organizers of the history. And I, I think we as historians should decide whether we're comfortable with that. Fantastic. Sean, anything you want to add at this point or we'll come back with other stuff? And I think we've got you on mute for a bit, Sean. Sorry. The only thing I would say about the negativity is that what I saw a lot of it, especially on social media, was just, you know, people talking about the statistics, um, you know, and I think, too, when it comes to Josh, his statistics, the number one question was about their home runs, right? And then, you know, you just get a lot of negativity about, like Larry and Scott said, it took a long time to calculate these stats, and people are still kind of still trying to discredit their work. So um, other than that, you know, it is what it is. Um, like they said, the stats are pretty solid, you know, and, you know, hopefully everything will work to our benefit and go that way. So that's pretty much it. Fantastic. I'll just, I'll just, before I hand things over to Bill, uh, to drill down a little bit on the uh, statistics, I'll, I'll just acknowledge and mark this is a little bit in response to uh, what you stated. In the articles I read and, and some of the comments to the articles, there were really three levels of criticism. One of them was exactly what you brought up. You know, is it MLB's place to decide whether the Negro Leagues were major or not, right? Uh, that was definitely one. Another one that I think there was quite a bit of uh, were people saying, hey, hold on, these, these leagues weren't as good as the National or American League. Sure, they happen to have, um, pretty much all the top superstars of the 1950s, except Mickey Mantle. Um, but the typical player was more like a double A. I saw a lot of that, right? I disagreed with it, but I did see a lot of that. Third, and I think this is a, a misconception that um, even potentially at, at Saber Day, I think there was a little bit of from Bob Costas, uh, was this idea that the statistics are so incomplete. And I think 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 
uh, that may have been a valid one, but uh, a lot has changed. So Bill, let me hand it to you. I know you're gonna jump into the stats. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue. And it, it's good to hear from Larry what you mentioned that the statistics are solid. And Scott, you had a wonderful thread on Twitter that had eight points to it continuing. You mentioned there was a little break with the walking the dog, but yes. there are a lot of misconceptions about the statistics of the, the various leagues that, that consisted of the Negro Leagues. And there are ideas that, well, they didn't really get covered in the local paper. There was no centralized statistical office. Can you talk about that? Because I, I was fascinated by that thread that you've basically nailed it. You found a lot of information. What other uh, myths or misconceptions still exist about that? No, no, that's great. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Bill. You know, one of the things that that I think people have been looking for for the past 30 years who are interested in, in baseball history and interested in the Negro Leagues is I think that they have been searching and waiting for statistics that look like the white major leagues, where you're going to have, uh, say, eight teams in the league and they played 154 games. And uh, the fact is that is not how the Negro Leagues operated, um, that there were uh, sometimes teams played 100 games in a season, uh, but a team in that same league might have only played 50 or 60. So the schedules were wildly unbalanced um, and uh, they didn't necessarily play uh, the same amount of games against each league opponent. It was a much different structure. It's kind of, uh, in my opinion, kind of like comparing jazz music to a country or something um, a little bit different. Um, you know, the Negro Leagues just function different. And what uh, Larry and Gary and Wayne and all of these guys who have been uh, laboring over this for the past 25 or 30 years is we have found what I would call the majority of the games. Uh, what you see at Seamheads right now is the majority of the games we have found. Now, I think Larry mentioned, we still find box scores uh, every month. Something new is digitized that we were unaware of. We are gonna continue to find games probably five or 10 years from now. Um, but we have found the overwhelming majority of these. Uh, we have a large percentage of the box scores, especially in the 1920s. And so what people don't understand is they don't know what they're looking at. Bob Costas does not know what the hell he's looking at he is looking at a near complete record of the Negro League, especially in the 1920s, uh, in certain years in the 40s and, and 30s. Um, and I don't know if Larry would uh, agree with that, but we have most yeah. of the data um, and we're still searching, but that's the, the one big misperception is people don't understand what they're looking at. They are seeing a near complete record for these league teams. Let me chime in here. Uh... Scott is right on point. In, in 1920, we find between 99 and 100% of the games. Schedules are printed in the paper. We use those as a tracking mechanism. All the schedules have been put into an Excel spreadsheet and we check that sale every time we find a game. The numbers are inputted, like I said, into a database that's uploaded to seam heads. Now take out the race factor and just look at the numbers. You can take any years, let's say 1933, uh, the Negro Leagues batted as a league 0.235. That same year in the American League and the National League, they batted 0.234 or 0.236. The numbers are within 1% variance. You go individually, you got Satchel Page, he strikes out about one batter per inning just like Nolan Ryan and Roger Clemens. Look at the home runs. You've got Josh Gibson hitting the home run about every 14th time at bat, just like a little bit higher than Barry Bonds, but a little bit lower than Hank Aaron. Statistically, you can say that the Negro League players are the equivalent of Major League players if you just look at the numbers. Uh, take out the race card, and you see that these players were right on par. And people get confused when they, when they say, well, all the Negro League players are great players. No, we had some ball players who hit below the Mendoza line. The, the, the statistics balance out. 
if you didn't know what league we were talking about, you couldn't tell by looking at the statistics only. Yeah, and one of the one of the comments in that thread that you had, Scott, was that sometimes the leagues are viewed very differently because of the length of the season. And the comment that had come up is that Major League Baseball 2020 definitely has a comparison to that. The Los Angeles Dodgers won the World Series. They played 60 games to get there. And we're not viewing that season any different or, or diminishing that title. I think that was an interesting comparison to come up with that. Yeah, well, I think, um, yeah, one of the only positive things that probably come out of COVID baseball is it gives people a framework for understanding what a Negro League season looked like. You know, the average uh, season was probably 60, uh, 60 to 70 games per team. And so it gives us a framework for understanding uh, somebody hitting 20 home runs. You know, we're not going to find a season where Josh Gibson hits 75 home runs. It just simply didn't happen. Not against Negro League competition. Um, but we do, thanks to sabermetrics, we have an understanding of how to sort of prorate numbers and, and uh, understand what that would translate to, say, 154, 162 game season. So, uh, you know, that would be the weird benefit of COVID baseball is we understand what a short season uh, would look like. Um, you know, I mean, another thing is we, we've all, we all grew up with the baseball encyclopedia and it's, you know, it's a, what I would call the encyclopedia distortion. Um, there, there's a little lie that we tell ourselves that the numbers that we see from Cap Anson and uh, Ty Cobb are the same as uh, Wade Boggs and Mike Trout. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, there was underhand pitching at the beginning of Major League Baseball. And we, we tinkered with the number of balls and strikes and the, the rules for sacrifice flies have fluctuated throughout the years. So we, this lie is when we see a, a leaderboard, we say, hey, this is all sort of apples to apples. And, and none of it is that, that baseball has changed constantly over the past 150 years. Um, so the idea that uh, the, the opposition to including Negro League statistics seems absurd. We have a lot of absurd stuff that's in the encyclopedia and this is going to become part of the official record. And um, so, so some of the things that we've been through with the short season, um, the idea of recognizing that baseball has changed so many different times over the past 150 years. Um, this is just adding to the history. It's, uh, I think, correcting it and filling a, ma you know, a massive gap. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to jump on a point that Mark made, and this has to do with, um, I think, a justified skepticism that Major League Baseball doesn't necessarily deserve to be the arbiter of, of the classification for Negro League Baseball. But think about it this way, <clears throat> 200 years from now, when people look at the historical record from 1920 to 1948, what are they gonna see? They're gonna see two white major leagues and they're gonna see usually two African-American major leagues side by side. Is that gonna reflect well on Major League Baseball or reflect poorly? it's gonna be like a scarlet letter that they will wear forever. It illustrates how this country operated. You know, you know, it's not just business or politics, it also was sports and entertainment, that African-Americans and dark-skinned Cuban players were not allowed to play Major League Baseball. And now you're going to see that forever. And I think it's, that's just the right thing to do. So I'm glad they did it. So Mark or Sean, any additions you'd like to bring to that? Uh, dealing with the statistics, uh, debunking any myths, mis misperceptions? Well, I, I agree with everything people have said um, and to pile on to what Scott said. I, I was talking to, um, I don't know if he's on this, on this or not, but Tom Schieber who works at the Hall of Fame and he was saying that uh, for his, their, uh, I think it's called the one for the book, which is their, the, the wing of the Hall of Fame that deals with record-breaking achievements. And he said, 
that they, I don't know if it was joking or, or if it was, if it was real, but they thought about calling it, um, they all have asterisks because essentially every number in major league history has a yeah, but associated with it, right? There was some advantage that they had that there, that is not true of other eras or in other ballparks and other teams. And, um, and the, we, we, and I take part, part of the blame for this because I've been a, a person that has written a lot of numbers in my, in my life. Um, but I think we take the precision of all of our numbers like pretty seriously. And I think we tend to get off put if someone gives us numbers that might not be precise. There was a lot of uh, pushback um, on the, even on our task force about like, you know, what, what are we gonna do if they add, you know, somebody, they find two more games for Josh Gibson and his batting average changes from, you know, 466 to 464. And I said, well, that's really been going on in major league history for a long time. Um, you know, the, the batting average for Ty Cobb has changed in, in my adult life. Um, the number of RBIs that Babe Ruth has changed just in the last decade. Um, so there isn't really as much precision in the record book as we think. And the major Negro leagues is probably a bit more of a mess than we're used to, but I think that's kind of what we're, we should be good at. I mean, we should be good at um, interpreting and explaining and understanding all the mess. And it's, it's kind of, I think why we love what we do and, and uh, I welcome the challenge. And Sean, anything? Uh, I mean, you know, those guys are to keep the statistics. That's not my area. So I'll, I'll leave it up to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So Jason, over to you. All righty, Larry, I'm going to begin with you. Okay. Uh, either based on the MLB announcement or independent of it, what do you see as kind of the next big focus in Negro Leagues research? Like, what do, what do you have your attention turned to? What do you mean by well, area? Yeah, I, I suppose. Or is is there anything you're trying to do? Like, does it does it sort of redouble efforts to find any missing box scores, or or are there certain years that MLB didn't count where you feel like maybe additional research there might make a difference? Well, there's always I will always try to expand uh, <laughs> the leagues from 1920 to 1948. I like to also add 1949 and 1950 so I can put in Willie Mays' third and second year with the Birmingham Black Barons. And it hurts my efforts to get someone like a Bud Fowler and Cannonball Dick Redding, and Grand Home Run Johnson, and Spotwood Poles, who played most, most of their career before 1920 into the Hall of Fame. But I'm willing to accept that challenge. Uh, but right now I'm focused on trying to get Major League Baseball to change that narrative when they say Bob Feller threw the only opening day no hitter in Major League history. Well, now that's Leon Day. He threw an opening day no hitter in 1946. And we also have uh, a World Series no hitter in 1926 by Clyde Red Greer for the Baccarat Giants. Uh, he pitched the first World Series no-hitter in Major League history, and not Don Larson. And so we got a lot of details we want to present and get it into the mainstream of baseball Americana. I mean, you got 1929, Rap Dixon had 14 consecutive hits playing for the Baltimore Black Sox. I think the league record is shared by uh, Johnny Klein and Piggy Higgins and Walter uh, Drupal of 12 hits. So that record now belongs to a Negro League player. And we got a lot of stats that will be changed. Uh, a lot of leaderboard uh, winners, champions will be changed, not stats. Uh, we can also recognize uh, Olivia Taylor as uh, 
one of the first female owners of a major league team, the Indianapolis ABCs in 1922. There's so much great history here we, we, we need to share. I uh, just got an email from uh, Watkins out of Birmingham. Now Rick Whitfield is the oldest major league ballpark in, in, the, in the country. <laughs> so, was, which was built in 1910. So we got all these narratives we need to change and update. And you got 1941 when Frank Duncan and his son, Frank Duncan Jr. became the first father and son team to play on the same team in the same year. This is 50 years before Ken Griffey Sr. and Jr. played together. We got all these narratives we need to change and update and a great opportunity to create more interest in the Negro Leagues. And that's the beauty of, of all this. I mean, and I'll leave you with, with this question for you trivia champions who are upset because you got to revisit those books because you might <laughs> lose in the next round. So I'll leave you with who is the only ball player in the history of Major League Baseball to hit a home run in the Negro Leagues and in the Major Leagues in the same season. So I'll let you marinate on that so we can move on with this discussion. <laughs> Fantastic. And we're, we're going to come back uh, to some of the some of the players that might not be household names for a lot of baseball fans who might become so as the narrative changes. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Rap Dixon because I believe his biggest fan is in our audience right now, too. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> but uh, Scott, let me send it your way as a Negro Leagues researcher. What's next on your list? Well, uh... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with Larry, where I, I'm, I'm a little bit sad that we're going to lose the careers of Rube Foster, <clears throat> and uh, we're yes. going to lose half of uh, John Henry Lloyd's mm -hmm. career. And, you know, I think one of the things that I would uh, be interested in is, is pursuing some sort of a classification for those teams uh, prior to 1920. Um, that would be high on my list. Um, I think certainly still meets the threshold of Major League Baseball. But more important to me would be the teams prior to 1920. Um, you know, I know what the argument's going to be. Well, you had the 1869 Cincinnati Red Stockings. They were, yes, a professional team. They were not part of a league. Uh, they predated uh, the National Association and National League. And that's the way maybe we're supposed to view the Indianapolis ABCs from 1916 or the Chicago American Giants from the, the teams. And, and I would say that's kind of bullshit um, only because we had African-American baseball teams in the 1860s and 1870s. We had mm -hmm. African-American major leaguers in the 19th century. We had dozens of African-Americans who played uh, professionally, played minor league baseball in the 19th century before the disastrous uh, Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which set this country right. back 70 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and, and I think that what we need to do is embrace uh, semantics, change in semantics that, we go from major league baseball to major major level baseball. And, and perhaps we need to consider independent teams as being of major league quality. And that might be the way that we can get Rube Foster's career recognized. I don't think the talent was any different when the ABCs and the American Giants played one another in 1915 or 1917 right. than it was in 1920 or 1924. And so I, that, that would personally be one of the things that, that, that I'm interested in pursuing and lobbying for. And I think there's maybe an opportunity to do that. Scott, you have my support. We've got to get these uh, pre-1920 players uh, more recognition. But on the upside, just think about this. Uh, Monty Irving gets another 10 seasons <laughs> added to his mm -hmm. major league career. He's now a 300 hitter <laughs> instead of a 293 hitter. Yep. Larry yep. Doby adds five seasons. Uh, yep. Roy Campanella adds nine seasons. Satchel Page, 18 seasons, and uh, mm -hmm. Hank Thompson, four seasons. So this adds to their career major league total. So that's the upside of what we do. Of course, the downside is not being able to get great ball players like Oscar Charleston and John Henry Papa Lloyd, who played before 1920, to get their stats added to the mix. So you bring up a good point. I feel you know, one of the other cool things, um, I'm sorry, is what we're not talking about is the, the geographic history of the Negro Leagues and what this is going to um, 
the opportunities this is going to create for people who are interested in studying is, you know, in 1943, I rebuilt that season for the Seamheads database. Uh, they played official games in more than 71 cities and towns. Um, so you're gonna see Negro League Baseball, official major league games now uh, played in Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana and Iowa in Indiana. So there's a lot of uh, small towns, large towns and everything in between that are now going to become part of the major league record. And I just think of the excitement for those communities and those areas that they get to sort of revisit this and study it and it becomes part of their of their legacy. You know, Larry was talking about the records about Rap Dixon's uh, hit streak. Um, you think about night baseball in 1930. Uh, the Kansas City Monarchs, they did this uh, years, what, five years before the Cincinnati Reds, they were playing night games, including uh, with their traveling lighting system, the first night game in Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, where Josh set a lot of his records, uh, mm -hmm. was in 1930, when the Monarchs came to play the Homestead Grays. This is going to, uh, it hasn't just upset the apple cart, it's, um, this is going to be an explosion. Uh, baseball history is, it changes from this day forward. Um, and that's part of the fun part, instead of being daunting and it's yes. going to be the, the excitement of a whole new universe that has been shunned and neglected. Um, and, and sorry, I'm getting fired up. I'll wrap it up in 30 <laughs> seconds here. I mean, we are on the edge of living history. Uh, we only have three or four guys who are still alive who played in 1948. We're losing these people. Um, I, I think Josh Gibson and Jackie and Satchel, I think their legacies have been cemented forever but it is the other 3,400 men who played in the Negro uh -huh. Leagues who I think we are saving. We're saving their legacies. And that is important. That is really, really important. And having talked to grandchildren and uh, the children of Negro League players, it is important to have a history that we can all be proud of. Um, and that is a big part of this thing that we're going to start to understand as, as, uh, as the records uh, are added to the Major League legacy. And that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful, Scott. Bill, I'm going to send it your way. Yeah, I was going to say that was actually a perfect transition. So my question, I'm really going to hand this over to Mark. Just this week, Savers at Negro Leagues Task Force issued their recommendations. You're looking at seven leagues and specifically from 1920 to 1948. Ultimately, a decision had to be made on time frame. And it's good to hear that discussion of there's an era before that uh, statistics that come after that fall outside of that. Mark, can you walk us through a little bit of, of maybe even take us back to the start of that task force? What was your responsibility? How did you go about it? And can you explain the recommendations? Okay, sure. Um, so um, after word became public that Major League Baseball was studying this, um, my initial thought was, okay, if this decision is, is gonna be made, which I was fairly sure something was gonna happen for reasons I stated earlier, um, what does this mean for Sabre? Like, how should we change our language? How, sh how, how should we propagate this change to, um, to you know, within our committees and everything, it was more. It was mostly kind of uh, organizational stuff, all positive. Uh, I knew it was going to be you know welcome, etc. Um, however, the more I talked about it with Scott, I think we we kind of thought, well, this is really something we should we shouldn't really wait. We should we should we should put our own stake in the ground and say this is what we believe, and we. I want to I want to be clear is that Saber doesn't really have an independent brain. I mean, we are made up of a bunch of people, and the we in this case involves asking the historians. I mean, including Larry, who's who's on this call, and and Leslie Heafy and Gary Ashwell and and uh, and and Phil Dixon and and Carrie Gillette and Ted Knorr. I mean, we talked to all these people about it, and um, I I believe that the we took what would be probably, you know, once we gathered together, e this being COVID in email, um, we, uh, it turns out that the, there was um, already consensus within the, ne the Negro League historian world as to what the major leagues were. 
And we took, I think, the conservative approach of, of, of choosing to recognize the ones that basically all historians believe were major leagues, um, which is what we did. However, we also uh, recognized that more discussion could be needed um, about what Larry said about the 1949 and 50 uh, Negro American League and the pre-1920 teams that, that Scott talked about. And also um, uh, a lot of the independent teams that operated even during this period. I mean, a lot of the, frankly, some of the best teams in, um, in New League history operated independently for a time, the Pittsburgh Crawfords and the Homestead Grays and, and the Kansas City Monarchs. Um, and there was a lot, there were people, there were voices in our group that thought that those should be recognized as well. And I think what we did is we took a step back and we said, okay, let's, let's agree on what everybody agrees on and, and put this stake in the ground. And then hopefully keep talking because I am absolutely going to be an advocate for um, what it is that Scott is interested in and what it is that Larry is interested in. And, um, and I think it's Saber's, Saber's stance is to revere the histor historians and revere the history. And, um, um, and I think that the historians are gonna tell us um, that we need to do a little bit more and I, and I hope that we do. Um, so it was Saber's view that we needed to um, get the consensus of the historians. That was step one. And then step two was how does Saber deal with all this? And, and that, that process is still ongoing. And that really has to do with language, has to do with how we, um, how we use the term major league. Like, what does that mean? Do we change articles? Um, how do the fact checkers deal with claims? Making sure that if someone says that Bob Feller threw the only opening day no hitter that someone traps that story and says, ah, you can't, we can't say that anymore. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of going to be working on that stuff sort of behind the scenes. Um, but uh, I hope that people perceive what it is that Sabre did as being uh, essentially listening to the historians and advocating for them. Or I should say for us, because I'm an historian. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, anything you'd like to add to that or Larry? Uh, yes, uh, 1948 well, was... Teams. Yes, 1948 was probably the demarcation period uh, because that was the last year for the Negro World Series. Uh, of course, I'd like to have it extended, but I will accept 1948 uh, for the next 12 months, and then I'll start a new passion, <laughs> a new <laughs> agenda to extend that. <laughs> and, and Scott? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think my internet was breaking up. I mean, I think we need to fight like hell uh, from defining the Negro Leagues with the same parameters we would use for white the white major leagues. I mean, it was so different. I mean, the quality of baseball was on unquestionably on par, uh, but the way the leagues, the way the teams were structured was a lot different. And I think one of the issues Mark uh, brought up is, is of interest to me is the independent teams, the Kansas City Monarchs, the Homestead Grays, the Crawfords, uh, all operated as independent teams um, who played regularly against the league clubs. And, you know, they, in my opinion, they need to be included. They, and the metaphor, and uh, John Thorne and I have uh, talked about this is, uh, the Monarchs were uh, like the Notre Dame was in college football. They, they just weren't part of a conference, but they were every bit as good as uh, other Division I teams, and it's just a different structure. Um, when you talk about the East-West All-Star Game, which was the Crown Jewel, the Midsummer Classic, and the Negro Leagues, uh, I think there's at least four years where you have independent players starting and participating in the East-West game. I think one year, the entire West team was independent. So um, you, you, I think you really have to seriously consider including a handful of those teams as part of the official um, statistical record. 
and I will reveal my secret and why I'm sort of pushing for this because well, A, number one, it's the right thing to do if you really wanna capture the history as it uh, was happening. But number two, it's the loophole that maybe and perhaps opens up the door to the pre-1920 teams. If we can accept that the Greys and the Monarchs and uh, the Crawfords were, were uh, of major league caliber in the 20s and 30s, we might be able to get the 1916 um, American Giants, ABCs um, uh, included as part of the record. But don't tell anybody that that's my secret plan, okay? Don't worry, this isn't being recorded <laughs> <laughs> or shared later. <laughs> we're we're going to delete that from the YouTube please, recording as well as listen. that bullshit. We're going to change right. that. Now well, we have okay. to do it twice. Uh -oh. so. <laughs> well, and I, I would also add to what Scott said earlier. He, he, your comment was, well, that someone just, people say, uh, what about the 1869 uh, red stockings to which I would say, sure, why not add the red stockings? Because I, I think that we, we, we have long um, considered league participation to be sort of a benchmark. And that is really just a prejudice, not a racial prejudice, but just a historical prejudice of this is how teams must be organized. And I think that the Negro leagues um, quote unquote, um, didn't always adhere to that. And that's just something as historians that we need to just deal with. Perfect. Yeah, so moving on to the next question, uh, Larry uh, had it earlier hinted at records changing. You know, we're, we're all baseball fans. We all love our top 10 lists. We love having those debates. But what are some of the statistics, uh, rankings that are going to change batting average, home runs, slugging? Open it up to anybody. Bill, that's a, a loaded question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> For the simple reason, whoever's writing the narrative will put in qualifiers that may eliminate any Negro leaguer from getting into the top career stats. He may require that a ball player has to play in 100, 1,000 league games to qualify for the top career batting average, uh, OPS, or slugging percentage. Well, that leaves Josh Gibson out because he only played in about 800 league games. So if you lowered it to 750, then Josh is in the top tier on just about everything. So it depends on who's writing the narrative. and. Uh, I know when I write, I own what I write. Uh, and I respect anyone who writes with the qualifier that he must play in 2,000 or 1,000 games, or he must have at least a minimum 3,000 at bats, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's the beauty of being able to control what we do. And that's what Saber does. So it's not fair, but. We will have some people in the leaderboards. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think um, if we if if it's baseballreference.com setting the parameters that uh, based on the stats we have right now, I think Josh Gibson would be number two behind Ty Cobb on the batting average list. I don't know if that's going to stand. I mean, we're, there's still going to be deliberations about which games to include in the official record. Um, I, I don't know if we're including the all-star games in the, the batting area. No, we do not. not that probably be not what qualifies and what doesn't. You are going to see uh, four or five Negro leaguers in the top 10 in batting average uh, with Josh Gibson at this point being on the top of the heap. But we know that, uh, you know, there, there's still going to be an auditing process to determine what uh, qualifies and what doesn't. And, um, and while that's occurring, um, knowing how hard working a lot of these guys are, we probably will find another four or five box scores for him. So, so things are going to be kind of fluctuating like the stock market, but there will definitely, when you talk about rate stats, there's going to be guys that are qualified, um, especially uh, offensively. Um, when you talk about uh, counting stats, uh, uh, and that's where it's going to be a lot different because of the short seasons that we discussed. You're not going to see anybody, um, and there's probably some Barry Bonds haters here, I'm sorry, but Hank Aaron's not going to overtake him. 
Um, you're not going to see Josh in the top 10 in home runs, but he, he would probably be there in terms of home run percentage and, yes. and that stuff. So um, yes. it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out, right? Oh, uh, most definitely. Uh, let's keep in mind that we follow the same guidelines as Major League Baseball. I mean, we know Reggie Jackson hit 10 World Series home runs, but they're not included in this all-time total. And so we don't include postseason or all-star uh, statistics in the career statistics, just like Major League Baseball does it. John, I want to I want to bring this to you, not as a statistician, um, but really as a fan and a family member. So, a couple of the articles that I read talked about what a shame it is that Josh Gibson is going to see his home run count. Uh, diminish from maybe 800 or 900 down to, you know, 200 or something like that, right? That that part of the MLB announcement, part of counting the records in the way that they might be counted is robbing Josh of 700 or so home runs. On the other hand, here's Josh who may find himself number two career in batting average, uh, you know, top three career in slugging average or OPS or all these mm -hmm. other things. One, one article I read positioned him potentially as the highest single season batting average of all time. So, so as Josh's representative here on earth, is that a net positive or a net negative uh, for his legacy and how his uh, greatness is viewed? Well, number one, I think it's, a, it's definitely a positive. And me and Scott talked about this because uh, I wasn't unsure of how they would do the stats because like I said, I did a probably close to 30 interviews and probably out of 30, 20 people asked me, 29 people asked me about the home runs. And when Scott kind of broke it down to me based on the home run was just based on the Negro League games. And we understand Josh's total is based off of his total games played as Latin balls, semi-pro, barnstorming, things like that. So I kind of understood that. But as you mentioned, um, Josh will be in several categories as I mean, like you said, the top five of several categories. And if they hold the stats for um, 1943, the batting average at 441, which I heard can even maybe go higher, um, that that also be great for us. So to make a long story short, you know, would it be the home run king or have four or five categories in the top five? I will have four or five categories in the top five. So. Um, but for us, it's just exciting, you know, to have these guys do this work and finally come out. But I think the most important thing is making sure that, um, you know, it, it gets to a, you know, my, and I'll just say it, it gets to a race issue sometimes. And sometimes I wonder, do, do, do society or do Major League Baseball want to see a, a black person, the all time single season home run leader? I mean, not home run leader, but single season batting average leader. Um, and so those are the little issues that, you know, our concerns of when you talk about these statistics, you know, it does come down to race and we all know what we're talking about, but, you know, um, the guys who've done the work clearly said that they stand by their work and we, we appreciate their work. I just hope that the, who's making the final decision, make the right decision. And the other thing, I hope there's no asterisk marks next to these guys. If you're going to put them in, put them in, you know, I, mean, I don't want to, I don't want to see no asterisk marks or anything like that. So those are some of the things that not only myself, but other family members had conversations about. Sean, you know, what? Uh, since you bring that up while you're still on the mic, I'm going to go a little off script. I know you, uh, you have relationships with the families of Satchel Paige, Buck Leonard, even Babe Ruth, right? Um, what's your sense from the other families in general, positive in terms of the announcement, excited or, or, uh, possibly bitter because it took so long. They're all excited. I mean, every, everyone is excited. Um, again, it's just more of, you know, the uncertainty of what's next. I think everybody's definitely excited. You know, everybody want to see exactly when this is actually going to actually take place, when you're going to actually be able to go into the record books and see Josh Gibson or Satchel Page or Buck Leonard's names actually next to the other players. And so I think that's the most important thing but overall, again, like everybody said, it was everybody was kind of caught off guard by the announcement. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And I think most importantly is that, you know, we're excited about it, definitely excited about it. Just want to see the next steps. But, you know, Satchel Page's family, we talked to Turkey Stern's family, all the family members uh, are kind of on the same page. 
um, excited about it, but, uh, you know, just want to see where the chips fall now. And, you know, like I said, I'm not the guy doing the stats. You have the professionals on here. They're doing all the hard work. And I hope Major League Baseball recognized them for their hard work as well. Um, and so that's the main thing. It's a lot of it's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, it seems like. So hopefully all the puzzle can, the puzzles can come together, the pieces of the puzzle can come together, and everybody's happy. Yeah. And then I'm going to bring this one. Uh, I think I'll start with Scott and then go to Larry on it, which is um, I'm just going to use as an example Artie Wilson. When I read the MLB announcement article and I saw that this, this might place Artie Wilson, as the last man to bat 400, I will confess to to having heard the name once, but actually not really knowing who he was, who he was, right? And I think for a lot of baseball fans, um, he may go from uh, somewhat an unknown to more of a household name, right? Becoming part of this larger history. Um, Scott, are there other players who you think most fans maybe still today have not heard of, who all of a sudden may find their legacy uh, or their profile in the game really jump up yeah well i think there's going to be dozens of guys uh, you know we've we've mentioned rap dixon a couple of times uh dick lundy uh john beckwith um charles chino smith uh those are all guys who were i think they were considered for um a, the hall of fame during the special election 15 years ago and came up short but we may be able to revisit those guys um, there's another one who I'm particularly fond of was Bill Zach Pettis, who was a, an outstanding first baseman, a great hitter and a, a great a base runner. So you're going to find dozens of really, really interesting players that uh, the common, the, the regular uh, history buff may have not heard of. Um, it's, it's nice that they're going to be able to actually look up the data online and kind of follow their paths. But um, there, there's definitely, uh, boy, and I think I would love to see Buck O'Neill get... <laughs> Uh, reconsidered for the Hall of Fame. Um, that was, um, and I, you know, I didn't know anybody in this game back then. Uh, that was one of the huge disappointments for me back in uh, 05 or 06. So, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be good. I hope that we revisit um, the legacies of uh, uh, dozens of these guys that pe people have never heard of. And, and Larry, I know in the Lester household, all these guys are household names, uh, but who are some of the names you would add to the mix that casual baseball fans might not know, but perhaps will know going forward? Well, as you mentioned, Artie Wilson, a slap hitter, pool hitter, who batted 402 for the Birmingham Black Barons uh, in 48, and teammate of Willie Mays. He should get more recognition. Uh, also, Al Gibson of uh, the Black Barons, he struck out 20 batters in nine innings. So he would join that list <coughs> with Matt Scherzer of the Nationals and Kerry Woods of the Cubs and Roger Clemens who did it twice with the Red Sox. So that changes that trivia question. Uh, but we got some unknown, unheralded great sluggers like Chino Smith who has the highest batting average in the season. Uh, who died at an early age of 30, and Oscar Heavy Johnson, uh, incredible hitter, or uh, Hurley McNair, uh, I call him the, the original toy cannon. He was much like uh, Gwen for the Astros. Uh, Newt Allen, an incredibly great second baseman who played on more championship teams in any Negro leaguer, 13 championship teams. That shows you his leadership skills. Uh, so we got so many unknown, unheralded, unappreciated Negro leaguers that, that need their recognition and their page in the history books. Uh, they're not all Hall of Famers, uh, but they had some great and wonderful careers, and we hopefully will someday recognize them for what they did to the national game. Fantastic. So I think we are we are getting toward the end. Um, I, I will I will say, Bill. I think you wanted to ask. Sean about his shirt. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you picked the right shirt for this. So I'm about to give you the floor. So it's my last question. There's a campaign to name the most valuable player award, the Josh Gibson MVP. Where are we with that happening? Can you give us an update? Tell us, the, tell us all the news about that. 
Well, yeah, um, it's exciting. Um, just to give you a little bit of background. So, of course, as we all know, during the whole Black Lives Matters movement um, back last year, there were several former MVP players who decided that Kennesaw Mountain Landis' name should be removed off of the MVP award. And so um, October, the Baseball Writers Association made that first step and removed his name off the award. But back before that, um, I'm just reading an article uh, in the AP and it talks about uh, Terry Pendleton and Mike Schmidt um, and Barry Larkin pushing to remove the name. And the names they were considering was uh, Frank Robinson, who's, you know, AL and and AL and NL MVP winner, uh, Branch Rickey, and of course, Josh Gibson. We didn't know nothing about it. Um, So, you know, I went back to my board and our family and our committee and said, hey, we just found ourselves in a race. (laughs) <laughs> uh, let's see how we can win it. And so since then, we've been on this campaign. And, and, and for the listeners who want to, who's on here, and I will say this, um, you know, for us, it's more of a, if you read my story I did for ESPN Undefeated, um, it's more poetic justice, redemption type article. And and the one thing is, you know, first of all, be a high, high ironic would it be for a player like Josh Gibson replace the same guy who denied him and other great Negro League players an opportunity to play in the majors. And, but what I will say is that um, if the award goes to Josh Gibson, it won't just be about Josh Gibson, number one. Uh, it'll be about the 3,400 men who were denied the opportunity. So Josh is carrying 3,400 men on his shoulders with this award. Uh, we feel as though is that, yes, it'll be named after Josh and we're, we're grateful for that, but it's, it's bigger than Josh Gibson. And Kennesaw Mountain Landis, as we all know, denied those great players an opportunity, at least 3,400 or more. And so that's that's our story. Um, of course, the other two great, two good candidates, and but we feel as though Josh is a great candidate. Uh, but yeah, you know, for more information, this is our T-shirt, our J. Josh Gibson MVP T-shirt that we we have to promote. We have, you know, we just got a, we got a several endorsements from the Pirates. Uh, the home team here is supporting us. Derek Shelton supporting us. Uh, Thomas Toll, who you may know, form one of the Pirates Stiller's owners. Stiller's owners. It's been a great campaign. I could say this one thing: it does has you know it has happened is that Josh's name. You know, if people didn't know who Josh Gibson was, they know about him now. Number one, and I would say too, um, when the announcement came on December 16th, when Major League Baseball made the announcement, that really helped out a lot too. Um, that helped out a lot, being that there was a lot of articles about Josh dealing with the home runs like we talked about. And so that gave me a chance to also talk about the MVP campaign as well. So uh, we don't have any updates. Uh, Bob Nightingale, he's been fighting for us. He's one of our main fighters on this. He's been keeping me updated. I just talked to him, but last week they were doing the uh, I know you all heard about they removed this the uh, Sphinx. They removed the name off the, his. They removed that. That was the last thing they done. I was joking with Nightingale because I said, "Well, man, hopefully I'll make a vote because y'all didn't vote any players into the Hall of Fame. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I'll do something." So, uh, but yeah, we don't. You know, we're just sitting here waiting. We don't know what's going to happen, but uh, we'll still keep in our campaign. For more information about our campaign, you go to jg20mvp.com. It kind of gives you our stories. And one of the things that we've been doing, we uh, for Black History Month, I've been posting a lot of things, but we also have um, different segments and captions from former MVP players that talks about Josh, uh, from Dizzy Dean to Ted Williams. I mean, you know, my grandfather, Josh Gibson Jr., always gave Ted Williams a lot of credit for actually putting Negro League baseball players into the Hall of Fame. He just felt that, you know, Ted Williams' speech in 1966 really helped get Satchel in in 71, and then, of course, Josh and Buck Leonard in 72. So we, we captured a lot of quotes from um, white baseball players that played in the air who speaks about, who talks and speaks about Josh Gibson. So we just wanted people to know that, you know, of course, none of us here saw Josh play, but for those great white players, as well as black players who saw him play, we use we use our quotes to help push his MVP campaign to prove how great Josh Gibson was. So yeah, just and just go our website. Yeah, just go to our website, man. You know, support it. Uh, there's a petition on there. You, you know, um, 
you know, I will say this because it's been brought up and then I didn't ask me the question, but since I have the floor, we have not gotten no endorsement from the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, I will tell you that, which is surprising because if if you're supposed to be about the Negro Leagues, how come you're not supporting your most one of your most famous baseball players? Um, and that's very disappointing to, to, to talk about, to, to that people have asked me about that and it's disappointing, but it is what it is. You know, one thing about these family members is that we know what we believe in and we're gonna push it no matter if we had the museum support or not, we support each other. And that goes for the Page family, Gibson family, Leonard family, and Stearns family. We just started our own organization called the Negro League Family Alliance. And so we'll be doing stuff all together. So we're definitely coming together as one. So we're excited to be a part of that as well. Man. Somebody John, in the chat you asked if you your... the website again. The website for the campaign is jg20mvp.com, jg20mvp.com. Our hashtag is jg20mvp. Then you can also just go to our Josh Gibson website to learn more information about the Josh Gibson Foundation. That's just joshgibson.org. Great. I'm just going to add two things uh, to, to what Sean said. So um, you know, this, this presentation wasn't really to talk about his foundation and the great work we do, but the, the, the Josh Gibson Foundation just creates awesome academic athletic opportunities for kids. So if you do go to joshgibson.org, there's a donate button and you should hit it. The money goes to good stuff. Um, so I was just, I'm just going to throw that in. I hope that's okay, Sean. Um, I'll, also, I'll also add that I, I had enlisted myself along with a few other big fans and supporters um, to do what I could to try to uh, promote the JG20 MVP campaign. And then uh, as it turns out, I think it may have been the last public statement Dick Allen made before his death to come out in yeah. support of uh, Josh Gibson MVP award. So yeah, uh, great point. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of greatness behind the campaign. With that, Bill, a lot of questions have come in. I know for our yeah. audience, may have stuck around even longer than they thought. Our guests may have stuck around longer than they thought. <laughs> things to go to. So we do appreciate that. Yeah, I do want to say for our guests, if we're keeping you from other commitments, you have fulfilled and you have done a remarkable job and we couldn't thank you more. Um, really a pleasure and an honor to have you. If you got to drop off, cool. And if not, stick around and we'll go through the questions and see where we go. Bill, do you see anything in the, in the questions to start off with? Yeah, we do, unless somebody wants to jump in really quickly. Oh, like live, like live. Yeah, Just, yeah let's try that. All right, unmute if you got a question. <laughs> All right, maybe hit We know the... you do. <laughs> hey, let me let me say something about the MVP campaign. Um, it just occurred to me, and I don't think Sean and I have discussed this, that in 1943, uh, there was a, an article in the Pittsburgh Courier, somebody interviewed uh, Josh about his career highlights and of course he had hit a lot of home runs by then in ship games and at that time in 1943 he said the highlight of his career was being named the most valuable player in the Puerto Rican League in 1941-42 mm -hmm. and he was the batting champ there for 80 had uh, I think 13 home runs and 120 so I think it's really important, Sean, that your great grandfather, what he viewed as the most important part of his career, the thing he was most proud of was winning the most valuable player award in Puerto Rico. So uh, I commend you, man. And I hope, I hope this happens for you. Yeah, actually I have, I have that trophy right here at my house. So um, Whoa. Uh, that's one of, that's one oh, of our pieces. <laughs> yeah. Y'all want to see it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like yes. Yes. I want to see it. All right. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Holy smokes. Okay, that's uh now that's uh, cool. It, Holy shit, yeah. we're gonna get to see something. <laughs> the baseball card and memorabilia collecting world. This is known as hashtag hobby flex. That's about to happen here. <laughs> 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 You know, guys, looking at the comments out there and the questions, it's amazing how many of our members were mentioning players right afterwards. One of the panel were mentioning these guys too. It's like, 
a lot of a lot of knowledge out there, and uh, uh, it's it's yeah. absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, one of the comments was actually, did we answer Larry's trivia question? Was it Ernie Banks in 1953? No, Ted Nor got it right. You know, Ted right on it. Uh. Willard Brown, 1947. Yeah, oh, okay. All right. Let's go back up that far. Yeah. So. yeah with the Monarchs and the St. Louis Browns. We cannot get anything past Ted Nor. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's great history. I mean, we look at Josh Gibson's career and he spent those two years in Mexico and those numbers would not count in the totals, uh, which hurts his, his career stats. But... These are the parameters that we have to work with. Uh, if, if Josh had spent those two years in the Negro Leagues instead of Mexico, his numbers would probably be off the chart. He's without a doubt the greatest home run hitter ever, but he may not be the career leader when we finish compiling all the stats because he played in fewer seasons than Mule Sotos or Turkey Stearns. So the, the numbers can be misleading sometimes mm -hmm. Larry Larry and Scott while we're waiting for the trophy presentation uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> John Rocanelli had a question he said any word how baseball reference is planning to handle the inclusion oh time out here comes trophy. the trophy yeah. <laughs> never mind oh here wait a minute <laughs> that's it right here my goodness awesome. this Whoa. was given to me so um, Josh Gibson had a sister Annie, and she has three girls. And when Annie passed away, this was in our house. And wow. they found uh, this bag, passports, contracts. Everybody, there was no, um, there was no gloves or or um, bats or anything like that. Just a lot of like things he brought back from uh, overseas, trinkets, souvenirs, and stuff like that. But. So this is the actual bat. And so we have it in this special case and uh, we got it appraised. So we have this, do you have this show here in Pittsburgh called Hidden Treasures? It's like the mm -hmm. antique road show. Right. And they always asked me to bring something down. And so about 12 years ago, I took it down. There was appraised about 75,000, but we'll never sell it though. Cause this is, this is the original trophy right here. 41, right. it says it on here, uh, 41, 42. I can't read Spanish, so I'm not even gonna try, but it's in Spanish. <laughs> so this is actually a trophy right here. And that was that was Puerto Rico. Thank Re you. That was a Puerto Rico, Scott, you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can read that. I can read I can read this. I, I can read that. It says Joshua to Joshua Gibson, the most valuable player in 1941-42, professional player of Puerto Rico. Hmm. Yeah. Oh man. Sean, before, before you put it away, let me let me get a picture with your face and with the trophy. <laughs> Outstanding. Oh, one more time. I might have got Larry instead. Say something, Sean, and then you'll be on screen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah, I got it. Okay, we man. got it. I love it. Oh, beautiful. We can still get it in the newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, John, well, I can send you. I can send you a better picture if you want a picture of. Oh, I can just send you a picture of it. We accept. Could you autograph it? Could you autograph it for me? The picture. You asking? Are you asking for a lot now? <laughs> hey man. But anything uh, for you, Jason. I got you, man. Uh, thank you. So, so well, for a uh, donation to the Josh Gibson Foundation. <laughs> there, you right. there you go. There you go. I've been going. I've been going there. He's but, made a lot of donations. He's done very well for us. He's helped us out a lot. So yeah, I appreciate it. Absolutely. So at this point, John Rocanelli's question is probably a little anticlimactic after we've just seen the <laughs> Josh Gibson MVP trophy, but um, probably for Larry and for, for Scott. Um, any word how baseball reference is planned to handle the inclusion of the Negro League stats in the major league totals and play index functionality? Also, are the stats shown on BREF accurate based on the research done by Larry, Scott, and others? Well, uh, I guess I'll start. I, um, I don't know about the play index. I know that the stats will eventually find a home at baseballreference.com. Um, I, I think um, what is available on there right now is it's showing you a glimpse of the research as it stood 
and Larry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, kind of where it was in 2005, maybe 2006. And now what you're seeing at seam heads is how far the numbers have progressed. And, and eventually at some point, hopefully this year, you're going to see the statistics from seam heads find a home at baseballreference.com. Now, whether, um, whether there's gonna be game log and play index stuff, uh, that would be a question that I cannot answer. Okay, I, I chime in here, Scott. In, in 2005, we had to submit our statistical database to the Hall of Fame. They, they gave us five years to gather all the stats and what have you. Uh, the stats had not been checked, but we had to turn them in as required by our contract. And the Hall of Fame sold the stats to baseballreference.com. Uh, mm. I submitted a report day by days of every ball player is about 5,000 pages. And they uploaded that to baseballreference.com. Uh, we have found roughly 30% more box scores since that period. And this is why Seam has, has the latest and greatest stats. Uh, nothing against baseball reference, but they wanted the stats immediately before the project was complete. <clears throat> We're out of funding. And so we had to turn in our report, but me and Wayne Stivers, Bill Plott, uh, Dick Clark and others continue to input another 30% more box scores into the database. And that numbers, those stats eventually went up to seam heads. So this is why you see the seam heads database more robust and the numbers are higher. Uh, nothing against baseballreference.com, but they don't have the latest and greatest information. Yeah, I can say um, what Scott says is true. I, you know, Baseball Reference is, is going to license the, the stats from Seamheads. And if I might chime in with a more selfish comment, um, I think this might have been in our announcement, but Sabre is, is also going to be licensing the data from Seamheads, in particular, the biographical data, so that our the um, baseball biography project um, will, will soon, once that agreement is, is implemented, will have pages for all of the Negro League players as well. Um, most of those pages will be empty because the biographies aren't written, but the existence of the page hopefully and uh, the work of current and future Sabre members will fill in those pages with biographies for the 3,400 or so players that uh, have suddenly been uh, been anointed um, to be in the, the database. All right, let me let me call a quick audible. Uh, Sean's going to need to run in just a minute. So I just want to open it up to anybody in the audience. If you want a chance uh, to ask a question direct to Sean, let's get you up here now. Okay, Sean, thank you so much for joining. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you very much, Sean. All right, don't thank drop you. that selfie. Yeah. <laughs> it's already back in the case, so all right. <laughs> Locked and key. I think I think the appraisers lowballed you, man. I, seriously, seriously, don't. <laughs> You're not going to sell it, but we're, I, not selling it. we're not selling it anyway, so it doesn't I, matter. I'm, more like, <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'd picture more like a million. But. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Good, good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. I also just wanted to acknowledge in the uh, chat, uh, thank you, Kevin Johnson. Kevin essentially uh, provided a similar answer in terms of the updating of baseball reference versus seam heads. So thank you, Kevin. Yeah, um, I was going to say the chat. There aren't many questions. There's a lot of great commentary. So <laughs> <laughs> take a chance as, to read it. So as incredible as this panel is, there's there's like there's almost as much Negro Leagues knowledge in the chat. <laughs> yeah, is there a way to export that? <laughs> we could have fielded a second and a third and a fourth panel out of this chat here. Um, all right, Bill, do you see anything else we want to cover before we close? I think we're good. I mean, we we, we mentioned uh, several announcements for, for both chapters. I, I just feel like if there's any other open discussion you'd like to have, we can certainly keep it going for a little while. 
Um, the other thing out there, uh, the websites that Sean mentioned uh, are out, if you didn't get it, write it down, uh, Ryan's got the one, Mike Carey's got the other, so you can go out and see those as well. Mm -hmm. Out in the chat. Man, well, gosh, everybody, same, same thing that I just said to Sean, uh, Mark, Larry, Scott, um, just, just incredible to bring the four of you together uh, with, you know, with Sean, of course. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I think I saw a lot of just positive thank yous, great presentation type stuff uh, in, in the comments. So uh, having you here, really appreciated. And uh, I'm, I'm ready to declare this one of the best joint chapter meetings ever. You know, our friends, in, our friends in Wisconsin root for weird teams and stuff like that. But <laughs> uh, I second all of that meeting. They do. I'm not sure about that weird team part of it. Other than that, I would agree with you. Uh, you know, and I think we also should think we the highest number I saw out here is we were up to 75. Yeah, uh, had signed in. Uh, so it makes just from a numbers wise our best meeting ever. Um, it this working with you too has been a real pleasure. We put together a quickly came up with two great ideas and put together a really good meeting. You did a super job moderating the panel. Uh, I, I I couldn't be more pleased with the results of our Saber Day. I agree 100 percent. I agree. I mean, discussions, Dennis, that we had long ago, we were like, let's let's blow them out of the water this year. I think we did. Yeah. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. And for anybody not part of the, the Wisconsin or Chicago chapters, um, I just got to say, my man, Bill Perch, co-host, he puts out Sabre's best newsletter. Uh, <laughs> but I think so. He puts out such a great newsletter. So, you know, if you can find your way onto our mailing list or wherever, wherever we keep it, I think SabreChicago.com, we actually post the newsletters down. But check it out, man. I'm so proud of the work that Bill does in our chapter. Does. The, the content you guys give me, it's top notch. So keep it coming. If, if anybody, even if you're in a different chapter and you'd like to contribute, you think something be relevant for our particular audience, contact me. So I always reference that newsletter and ours new newsletter. It, it makes ours look a whole lot weaker, but it actually. <laughs> Having the content in there makes us look good. So uh, yeah, I agree with with that comment on the quality of that newsletter. Great, thanks. Uh, it's, it's it's a pleasure putting that one together. So all right, all right, well, gentlemen, thank you for having thank me on you. your show. Yeah, great. Right on. Thanks, 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 everybody. Great thanks, to talk. Guys. We'll see all you. Right. Bye, Bill. Bye. -bye.